Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for November 9, 2015. A uh, couple of points up front. First of all, uh, we, to all of our veterans in Arlington, uh, first and foremost, thank you for your service. And we want to invite all veterans and all citizens on Wednesday, November 11th, uh, to a parade and a ceremony honoring our veterans and the service they provided to all of us. Uh, the parade will take off at 10.30 from the Walgreens parking lot, and we would ask that any and all veterans would join us there and parade to Monument Park at the Arlington Center Fire Station, where we will hold a ceremony. This will be held rain or shine, so please, we welcome you. Uh, secondly, tonight, uh, uh, Mrs. Mahan will join us shortly. Uh, we have a little bit of a... Um, Split meeting tonight, uh, we'll deal with the uh, first part of the agenda here in the selectmen's chamber. And then, um, I don't know, somewhere, I guess around eight, we will uh, move to the Lions hearing room uh, for the uh, discussion on the mill and mass traffic lights. And then we will return here to the chamber to close the meeting. Item number one, Mr. Gilligan, our treasurer, sir. Bond approvals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, I'm very pleased to um, appear before you this evening and ask that the board uh, vote uh, the approval of the sale of uh, $4,362,000 Series A bonds, general obligation bonds, $3,225,000 Series B refunding bonds, and $9,232,000 in bond anticipation notes. Um, you have my memo before you, um, Mr. Chairman. I will not read it, but I will just like to point out some highlights. Uh, with respect to the $4,362,000 general obligation bonds, uh, the winning bidder uh, on last Thursday's uh, sale was Fidelity Capital Markets, and those Series A bonds uh, attained an average interest rate of 1.854%. The Series B refunding bonds, the winning bidder was also Fidelity Capital Markets, came in at an average interest rate of 1.5066%. And Eastern Bank was the winning bidder on the bond anticipation notes with a net interest cost of 0.397%. Mr. Chairman, I want to point out to the board that coupon rates for bond issues continue to edge up slightly uh, as time goes on. But as I've mentioned to you before, especially at our last meeting, that we were doing our best to look at projections in the market and basically try and come back with the best results possible. I just want to point out the day after the bond sale, the average interest <coughs> rate was up a quarter of a percent. So we did very well across the board. A contributing factor to the incredibly low interest rates for the bonds was that we received a, a premium on both Series A and Series B. The premium re we received, which is in essence a, a cash payment creating a discount, was for $554,176.76. The Series B bonds included a premium of $244,307.05. I must point out, Mr. Chairman, that that premium will be deposited in the refunding escrow account that's part of your vote this, e this evening to defease the called bonds. That's the best way to, uh, to uh, accrue the savings. Um, with respect to the uh, refunding bonds, Mr. Chairman, the actual savings on refunding those previous issues from 2005 and 2006 has realized a savings of $313,116 to the town. Phenomenal results, Mr. Chairman. I also want to point out that, again, for the 11th consecutive time since 2008, Standard & Poor's rated the town or affirmed the town's long-term credit rating as AAA. In addition, the bond anticipation notes were rated as an SP1+, which is also the highest rating attainable on bond anticipation notes. You'll also notice, Mr. Chairman, that in the back of the memo is a rather long vote that the board is asked to take. The vote is a little longer this evening because of the three issues, Series A, Series B, and the notes but also because bond councils across the state are asking that the best practices that cities and towns employ now be included in the votes. 
So that's why you'll see language in there relating to the escrow account, uh, full disclosure, um, and, and things of that nature. And if you have any questions, Mr. Chairman, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Are there questions from the board? Yes, Mr. Hero. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work on this, Mr. Treasurer. Um, I was just <coughs> curious. You, you mentioned that the day after we floated this, that, that uh, rates went up a quarter point. Is it uh, considered yeah. that's factoring in already anticipated Fed action? It, it, some have argued that. I don't think so. I think it was just a combination of demand on the marketplace yeah. more than anything else. Um, but it is something that, that his, is hitting the bond market because the Federal Open Markets Committee is discussing increasing the interest rate come their December meeting. Yeah. And that's something we all have to take a look at. Great. Thank you. So um, am I looking at the right thing, vote to approve the bond sale, Stephen, or there's a different vote? Yes. The actual vote is the last uh, two sheets of the memo. You'll see it says vote of the Board of Selectmen. It includes the, the uh, payment schedule. It includes uh, the other votes which require an escrow account, full disclosure and things of that line. Okay, that does, it have, does that have to be read? It does there? not need to be read. Okay. All you have to do is say as voted as it appears in the memo. Okay, so is there a motion then please? Mr. Uh, Dunn. Move we approve uh, the sale of these bonds uh, using the language as uh, specified in the second, or, sorry, third and fourth page of the Treasurer's memo. Second. Second, second. further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the board for its time. Thank you. In the future, is there any way that we don't have to sign like 118 pages uh, for these? Uh, any way at all? Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, the answer is My no. Signature. No. It, they cannot be stamped. They must be signed. I know. And we thank all have their financial instruments, and it's for uh, it's for the benefit of the town. Of course. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thanks, Stephen. Mr. Chairman, the Wi-Fi is back on. Just okay, so you know. let me just make sure I'm... Because <coughs> we definitely need it for this next... <coughs> okay. I have a minor technical issue we're trying to work through. There is uh, quite a report that our comptroller has put together for us, so I know that Mrs. Mahan wants to be able to access that. No, that's all right, Diane. It doesn't work, I'll just sit down. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yep. Want to just do that, take this? Yeah. If you can figure out how to minimize that. Thank you. All right, so it is with great pleasure that for his um, first official meeting that we welcome our comptroller, Mr. Richard Visquet, who is here to make his first quarterly <clears throat> report. Mr. Visquet, welcome, sir. How you doing? Doing well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mother Chairman. Town, have, have you noticed the superb leadership in this town <laughs> oh, yeah, versus yeah. other towns that you've worked in? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Emphatically. No. Go ahead, please, Richard. Thank you, and uh, thank you, members of the board. Um, when I had got hired here um, back about two and a half months ago, there were some um, questions about reports that um, should be or uh, were interested in being reviewed by the selectmen. Um, and I have taken the time to try to put something together that I hope uh, represents what you're asking for, and if not, I'd be happy to change it, and, uh, shorten it, lengthen it. Um, but the cover page, um, if you're looking at it, on the left is a summary of the reports that are within here. It's a revenue summary um, going over the property taxes, overlaid, deferred taxes, local receipts, and your state aid and then some summary documents on the enterprise funds, the capital uh, budget for the town, and uh, year-to-date summary expenditure reports for the school and the town. On the right-hand side, um, I just listed some of the balances um, from the balance sheet that I think would be of interest to the board. Uh, fiscal stability fund, $20,789,000. The stabilization fund, which is the general rainy day fund, uh, has a current balance of 2.98 million, 
uh, health claims trust fund at 2.8 million, cemetery perpetual care at 5.8 million, and the uh, OPEB liability, that's the other post-employment benefits, um, there's $8.89 million in there. You'll see on the bottom, there's uh, to be determined on the free cash and the retained earning balances for uh, year-to-date balance sheet that closed uh, June 30th. Those uh, balance sheets have been submitted to the Department of Revenue, and we are awaiting their certification, and I should be able to update you hopefully very shortly on both the retained earning balances of all five enterprise funds as well as the general fund uh, free cash balance. Excuse me. So um, not sure how you'd like me to go through this report, but I'm happy to uh, give you a quick summary. Uh, the revenue is uh, summarized in Excel spreadsheets, basically for property taxes. I put the current year to budget um, estimated, which is the first and second quarter. Uh, preliminary tax bills show you what we collected last year at this point, what we've collected this year at this point, and um, give you uh, an idea where we stand. Uh, this year, I believe the first year of the Community Preservation Act, so you'll see that we do have a commitment in there for those funds, and uh, we're on schedule with collecting what we, um, what we anticipated at this point. Um, right underneath that is the reserve for overlay, uh, reserve for abatements, which is your overlay. You'll see that we have the uh, 2015 overlay that we raised, balances from the prior years, year-to-date decreases, which would be the abatements that were given through uh, June 30th, and then the balances as of June 30th. Um, deferred taxes are just taxes that are deferred through Mass General Law for uh, specific purposes, particular purposes. Uh, that's just a summary of what those uh, receivables were at the beginning of the fiscal year and what we've collected and the balances as of September 30th. Uh, those are pretty much the tax revenues. Uh, the next one is the local receipts. Local receipts are all the estimated revenues we anticipate um, that we collect through um, the Department of Revenue, page three of the recap, which is motor vehicle excise, uh, meals tax, fees, rentals, et cetera. Again, not to read the whole report, but um, wanted to put on there what we've collected last year at this point, what we've collected this year at this point, and give you an estimate on, um, give you an idea where we stand on the benchmarks there. Same, uh, same exercise for the state aid, the cherry sheet money. What we've um, anticipate receiving through the estimates from the Commonwealth and what we've actually collected through this uh, first quarter of fiscal year 16 and um, increases and decreases. And then for the enterprise funds, I just did a, a summary roll up of revenues and expenditures for the five enterprise funds of the town, water and sewer enterprise fund, the Veterans Memorial Skating Rink, the recreation, Council on Age and Transportation, and the Youth Services. So that is, um, that's a, a brief summary of what we've put together for the revenue portion of the uh, ledger. I'm happy to stop, answer questions, or continue on however you'd like me to proceed. So uh, what's your initial impression? We in good shape here? Yeah, uh, the, the revenues look like they're coming in um, right where they need to be. It's um, revenue estimates are on the conservative side, which is nice, which allows for the uh, us to hit the mark and, and create some surplus and generate free cash. So nothing, uh, nothing odd has stuck out yet. It's still um, two months in, I'm still learning a lot of the systems and how some of the money's coming in and out in the different particular ways. But for the most part, there's um, nothing I've seen that would cause an alarm or, or, or cause concern at this point. So I believe from revenue perspective, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. Awesome. Colleagues, questions, comments? Question, Mr. Kiro. Thank you. I, I did have one question on, on the revenue. I, I noticed that we're about a, a million down on, on um, real estate collections versus this time uh, last year. Is that a typical variance? Um, I it's hard for me to um, tell exactly what happened last year. I'll, I'll be honest. I, I saw it went down a bit too, and that could just be timing of post, and it could be lockbox at the end of the quarter and, and the way it's posted. Yeah. Um, I was, this particular uh, 51.9 million is your first and second uh, quarter estimated tax bills. <coughs> yeah. The tax bills were due on, um, at, the, at the end of uh, October. Yeah. So you got one more month to get that 50% money in. So for the first quarter and then September 30th, it won't, it doesn't fall well for real estate taxes because 
you'd rather it be that August 31st and October 31st. So you can see if you got those first two quarters right. in. Right. It's actually November 1st that the second bill is probably due. So it could just be a timing issue. I mean, your quarter, you, you've collected half of what you committed at this point, yeah. as I look at it. So I don't see any concern. I think it's more of a timing issue than I, uh, a real estate collection problem. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? No. Ms. Mahan. <clears throat> First, I want to thank you for all the information that you have provided. Um, it, it, I think there's about 45, 46 pages of it, and I, I definitely do appreciate it. Um, if I could just take one category, just to pose my question, to make sure that I'm reading this appropriately. Um, if, if I go to uh, Enterprise Funds Revenue Expenditures for Youth Services, which I believe is on page 9 of 45, and then if I look at intergovernmental CDBG, it says um, 17,000, and then it lists 15,455. Am I reading that correctly, that of the 17,000, 15,455 has been spent, or am I reading that incorrectly? And, and that, that was on page 945 um, under Enterprise funds for youth services. That's a, that's revenue. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's revenue. So that's not. So it's what we've um, received. <coughs> so we've received um, fifteen thousand four hundred fifty-five of the anticipated seventeen thousand for CDBG. For CDBG. And that's usually just okay. a, um, a a posting, not necessarily money we collect, but it's just a, a an entry we'd make on the controller. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's not an expenditure. It's revenue. So. Okay. No, I, I just want to make sure yeah. I was reading it correctly. Sorry. But, but I'm now confused because the top does say revenues expenditures summary. So where's the expenditures? Oh, right underneath it, you get your personnel and your expenses. Oh, under So it says revenue and it gives you five categories and then right underneath the expenses. Okay. I was testing you. you you're correct. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad Sorry I passed. I, yeah. I, Sorry. I, I, and I know we're, we're talking, we're asking <coughs> you to give us stuff. Um, three quarters of the year through, which is really difficult to do. So um, just two more questions that I would just pose um, as examples. The first one is, and I don't know if you or Mr. Viscay or the town manager could point me towards that. Where would I look in a report like this and or is it something, if it isn't in here, and I'm sure it is because you provided so much documentation. I'm going to use a, an example, the um, elevator at the high school, um, unanticipated expenditure needed to build, I guess, a brand new piston of like $90,000. Is that somewhere contained in here? Or is that something that um, isn't in here, but we can look? Well, one of the things that I'm interested in, in the reports that we get is um, sort of unanticipated um, expenditures that we have when they occur, how much they are, and where they're coming from and what gets left out. Is that something that's in, I wouldn't expect it to be, but is that something that's in here? Um, well, this particular report it won't be because we haven't probably received the bill received and paid the bill it. To November but um, the schools, um, when we get to the report from the schools, I found a summary document that the school uh, CFO actually does for the school committee uh -huh. that I've included in here. It's a roll up of a report that I had initially wanted to put into this package, but my report was about 85 pages. Mm -hmm. She added it into three. I figured the three would be better. Mm -hmm. um, the short answer is it won't be in here, but all expenditures of the town are in our reports. Where exactly they would pay that from and how they would get that money, that might be uh, unique to each situation. Now, the schools have a bottom line budget. Mm -hmm. um, if they have an emergency repair, they may find the money within their budget, but how they go about um, offsetting that anticipated Repair, I would actually have to probably defer to the town manager on how those uh, particular instances are handled on the school committee. But we do have a reserve fund in the town that handles that. But on the school side, I'm not, um, I'm not crystal clear on where that money's coming from for the emergency from repair and, and how they're going to address it. Maybe, maybe you have an answer. So if you go to page 43 of Mr. Biscay's document, the final line on page 43 mm -hmm. references elevator maintenance and repairs. It says what? It's, oh, elevator okay. maintenance and repairs. Mm -hmm. It lays out that the FY16 budget for elevator maintenance and repairs was 40,000. 40. However, in the 
uh, third to last column no. uh, has a new total estimated expenditures of 120, so with a variance of 80,000. Mm -hmm. Like any department, you'd ask the school department to make it up within their bottom line at year end. Mm -hmm. And if they were unable to, the reserve fund is open to both any town or school department to come and make a request to the finance committee. Okay, and then um, in terms of, I know on the town side, we're um, utilizing the MUNIS system. Is that, this, if you know, is that the same on the school side in terms of MUNIS, or are they still doing? For the general work? ledger, we use MUNIS school and town. Uh, what the schools do, because of the volume of the reports, is they'll sometimes dump it into an Excel spreadsheet and modify it for reporting mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but we are using the MUNIS system for school and town on uh, general ledger. Okay. M my ideal situation would be when we can get to that point that everything is MUNIS totally, just because I think it's um, the, the software we've adopted. And then the only other thing I'd, I'd sort of put on your to-do list, um, mm -hmm. and I know it's come up um, at Finance Committee, and I know when I've watched the meetings, um, the town manager, Mr. Chapdelaine, was there. Um, individual members of the Finance Committee have talked about mm -hmm. sort of really <coughs> redefining and getting a better, better handle on special education funds, um, how they're distributed, how they're allocated, and how they're um, estimated. Now, that isn't your purview per se, because that is the school side, but just in terms of, I know a few years back we were talking about consolidated finance uh, committee, et cetera, and a lot of that was to um, open the door between the, the town and school side. So I'd be interested in the future um, <coughs> if the opportunity presents itself or avails itself, but it seemed to me that at last year's finance committee, mem committee meetings um, that that was discussed and that would be something that we'd try to get a handle on. Um, and I don't know if I'm enca encapsulating this correctly, but um, I just want to give you sort of a heads up that uh, in terms of sort of tracking special education, I think what I was hearing from some members of the finance committee w was that um, we really kind of break that down more, um, get a better handle on it, as well as sort of <coughs> allocate it as a separate, um, I guess, line item or something that we can really keep track of more along the lines of there has been a trend um, that um, money gets allocated for special education, it goes back to general <coughs> education, which is fine, but it kind of falls in the field of how's that, how that's tracked. Am I getting anywhere close to that, Mr. Chapdelaine? So I, 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 I feel as if the CFO <laughs> tracks it pretty clearly uh, and brings it to the Finance Committee and lays out uh, where special education expenditures have been. The, the discussion is really focused on there are, we allow it within the budgetary plan, within the long-range financial plan, to grow by 7% a year. Mm -hmm. There have been years where it's exceeded 7%. In recent history, the growth, the actual growth in expenditure has been below 7%. So the discussion has revolved around whether or not 7% is the right number. If spending is under 7%, should it go into a reserve fund, and how that should be handled. Okay. So that really wouldn't fall under your umbrella. I mean, in terms of reporting, I think it, it does fall to the school department. Okay. All right. So whatever we can foster um, in terms of um, working cooperatively on the school side. Um, and I know you, you're definitely capable of doing that just by evidence of what you've produced. And I do want to thank the chairman, um, who I know met with Mr. Visquet um, and brought forth um, my colleagues and myself's um, interest in terms of uh, reporting vehicle to us. And any, any and all information that we can all get, I think, um, we, we definitely do appreciate that because um, yeah, more welcome. is more. I definitely do. It's not a problem at all. I'm happy to try to follow up on any um, particular questions. Mm -hmm. The uh, special education certainly is on a macro level. I can give you budget to actual numbers, but, mm -hmm. you know, some of the inner details of that would probably defer to the CFO in the, in the school itself, but I can uh, certainly do some research on it. Okay. And, and once you've got your feet wet, which you already have, and you're, you're firmly planted down there at the comptroller. Um, I'd certainly, mm -hmm. along with my colleagues, appreciate, um, which is something we talked about during the interview process, getting yeah. 15, 30 minutes of your time in your office at your convenience, um, just to kind of pick your brain and then you tell me what I should be asking for and shouldn't. I definitely a appreciate anytime. that. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm here to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you. Sure. So um, just to continue on, uh, one of the items I thought you'd find interesting is um, a summary of 
all the capital appropriations that have been done since um, I think it goes back <coughs> to 2003 and uh, the report before you is the appropriations that have been made uh, the carry forwards from each fiscal year which would be represented the transfers adjustments and then um, give you yet a date what we've ex expended what we've encumbered and the available balances so that's about a four or five page report that goes back and gives you detail on every single appropriation for capital and where they stand um, so hopefully uh, that summary document will give you some idea where we are and um, I sit on the capital planning committee as you know and um, these available balances are being contemplated now whether they need to be carried forward and continuing on with projects or if they can be uh, repurposed for future capital needs and, um, and and those conversations are ongoing right now so if there's any particular question on uh, any of those I'm happy to answer those don't know if I could do it off the top of my head but certainly would follow up with you on that um, and then the last part is basically uh, for the town side I printed out right from the Munis ledger a year to date budget report that summarizes expenses and salaries again trying to keep it as uh, brief as possible I didn't give every particular line on it for each particular department but the summary as I believe it's voted by town meeting so it represents um, what's been voted any revisions transfers adjustments what's been expended what's been encumbered in the available budgets in the percentage of how that's been expended so that's the Munis report and then the last three pages are the school expenditure report that's been rolled up into a, a summary document um, kind of put both of those in there so you can get a feel for if you, if you like the, the summary on the spreadsheet better we can modify if you like to see it out of Munis with the fancy title on the top and everything we can do that as well and um, again these reports are what I believe would be of interest to the board but happy to give you more give you less and um, work with you on delivering these goods every quarter thank you. yes mr. Dunn uh, a couple items first thank you very much really oh. enjoyed it uh, this is definitely the the type of thing that I was that I've been looking for that I was hoping to get and I'm really excited uh, to see it so thank you um, my first question was uh, I guess it's kind of a question or comment. So in the, the, the section that you just covered most recently with their talk, with mm -hmm. the Munis report that talks about the one that maps the votes of town meeting, mm -hmm. uh, there are parts of that that map really easily to town meeting, like just eye to eye. Like, for instance, when you look at town clerk expenses and town clerk salaries, town clerk expenses and town clerk salaries and what we vote are really pretty clear. But then there's a couple, uh, but then some of them, uh, for good reasons, I think we lump together and the, and the, the, when we do our votes in town meetings, so for instance, like police indemnity, I'm pretty sure that's going to end up under insurance. I, uh, it's actually one of the general warrant articles. Oh, all right. So see, the, so yeah. there's a couple of them, and I, it, I'm not sure exactly how much effort this is worth, but it's just to think about: is there a way to generate a report that matches a, a little bit? Um, Either change actually. So one way to do it is to talk to uh, Al Tosti and the Finance Committee and say, you know, hey, let's. Talk. This is the way we actually track it in the Munis system. Maybe we should adopt, or modify our vote somewhat to, to match. And the other thing is maybe we should just say, you know, Munis is doing what it's doing. Town meeting is doing what it's doing, and we should uh, try to do a report that match uh, a little bit closely. I, I say this loving what I have right now. I'm just trying to, you know, make it a little bit better. The Munis reports can be, uh, there's a there's a crystal report module that allow you to manipulate the data into formats that you'd yeah. prefer. So that's certainly something that could be done. It's, um, you know, it may take a little bit of an effort or, or some, I'm sorting the data, but it's nothing that we, we couldn't accomplish. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, my second thought is that, uh, so we do some really things that I'm really proud of uh, in terms of putting uh, data online. In terms of including the visual budget uh, project, have you seen that you've seen the Arlington oh, yes. visual budget? Okay, good. Uh, of course you have. And um, <laughs> the um, uh, the open checkbook. And so I really like that those two things. And I would love it if this report were to were. I mean, it, because it's being here in this open meeting, that means it's on the town website under the board of selectmen. But I think you could also put it up. Uh, under under sec like a different section and just have like it, or you know like this is 
essentially you, not just a report to the Board of Selectmen, but a report to the community, and you could put it and foster it as that, and it could be one of our tools of transparent government. And I think, uh, so thinking about ways to making it ex uh, uh, available and accessible and understandable to, uh, you know, general reader. I know what some of these things mean, so, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm uh, uh, looking at the uh, website for the Comptroller. Yeah. There is, um, it, it could use some a few more bells and whistles, so this is, um, Actually, the school department actually puts all their monthly reports online. So when I was talking to Diane Johnson about this report I was going to present to the selectmen, she had actually pointed me to what she does online. And I printed the section of the schools right off theirs, and I actually like the way she did it. So I may just take a little of how she uh, lays out her monthly reports to the school committee and, and mirror that. I think it's a great tool, too. So happy to do it. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Are we all set? Um, yeah, I guess um, the only thing I'll say, I, I do like the collaboration that you're talking about with the schools already, and I think you're going in the right direction with this. So I know it's early, but look forward to see what else is in the store. Thanks, Rich. Great. Appreciate it. So is there a motion to receive? Move receive. Second. So second. Uh, uh, do we need 45 pages the next time Mr. Biscay comes back here? You want it? You I, want I would. It. I say it's all just electronics. Would you add another 15? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Mr. Byrne. I, I think that uh, on a monthly, um, you know, on a quarterly basis even, I, I did like, you know, having Rich here today, but I think even just getting the report is a step in the right direction. I know it's a, it Absolutely. takes a lot to come here at night, and I don't know if Rich will be needed every quarter. Maybe, you know, we can spread that out or discuss it moving forward. Um, okay. But I think just the report's good with me. Okay. Sure. I, what, I would ask any of my colleagues, if there is any changes you'd like made um, or additional information, please contact uh, Rich. He and I have had our um, 30 minutes, and I, I hear, Diane, you'd like one, and I'm sure our, my other colleagues as well. So all those in favor of receipt, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Consent agenda. First of all, the minutes of the meeting for October 5th and October 19th. Request for contract to drain layers license. J. Durenzo Company out of Brockton. Reappointments of the Arlington Cultural Council. Joseph Burns. Reappointments of the Arlington Historic Districts Commission. Stephen McCauka. Beth Cohen. John Warden III. Reappointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. And a request for free parking for first lights and holiday shopping. Uh, this would be for the Saturdays starting after uh, Thanksgiving and up and through uh, Christmas. Anybody here wishing to speak on any of those matters? Move approval. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Mm -hmm. These are now appointments, and we ask the appointees to be here to the Arlington Cultural Council, Lauren Richmond. <coughs> Lauren, please come forward. We have to grill you, Lauren. <laughs> Hi, thank you very, very much for your willingness to serve on the Cultural Council. Why are you willing to serve on the Cultural Council? <laughs> uh, well, I moved to Arlington uh, in September of 2014, and I've been very eager to uh, be more involved in the arts community locally. I work um, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and uh -huh. um, while I enjoy that, I wanted to be more involved locally. So. Okay, great, thank you. Comments, Probably. questions from the board? Move approval. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Second. You look like you're dying to say something, Mr. No, Carroll. I just want to thank you very much for, for volunteering and for getting right in there. Um, I think you know there's a lot going on in, in the town, and um, the Cultural Council has uh, funded, uh, directed funds towards uh, a lot of great efforts, some of which have been really recognized on a statewide level. So we look forward to your energy and enthusiasm. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. On the motion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. It's unanimous. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and an appointment to the Park and Recreation Commission, Elena Bartholomew. Good evening. Very nice to see you. Why would you like to serve in the Parks and Recreation Why not? Commission? <laughs> <laughs> I've been there as an ass. you first. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there as an associate member to sort of learn the right. mm -hmm. processes going on and with 
the passing of Jim, that position opened up, so it's sort of a natural flow to move in. Yeah. And I'm involved with a lot of the youth activities. I was in town, and I thought it would be a nice step to get involved. Thank Move you so approval. much. Move approval. Second. Second. Discussion? Yes, Ms. Mahan. First, I want to thank Elena. Um, I know when I first got involved in Arlington up at Brackett School and got roped into PTO, sort of roped yep. with, went along with Elena, um, the start of it. Um, which was sort of my first experience, and, and I know from firsthand um, working with you on the PTO efforts that we have, as well as I know that you and your family has long been invested in youth activities, sports activities, and other um, youth offerings. Um, I, I do like the uh, system that Mr. Conley and the town manager have set up with um, sort of associate members, mm -hmm. if I'm going to say it correctly, and I know uh, Ms. B Mrs. Bartholomew Lane <coughs> has served mm -hmm. in that, um, and um, I do know that Jim Robola spoke very highly of you um, in terms of, you know, your service, service as an associate member, and um, I know you'll fill his shoes well. Okay. Um, and, and I really want to thank you for stepping up to this, as, first as being an associate member, because um, it's really sort of a unique position that, well, well, from what my understanding is, you don't necessarily get to do the ultimate vote, but the associate members are really active and involved with discussions of, of current um, issues before the Park and Rec Commission, so it's not like you're kind of jumping in there and yeah. trying to learn and get your feet wet. You've it's a great model for right. committees, yeah. to, for somebody as opposed to just jumping in and trying to figure out how, the, how it works. Mm -hmm. And it's great. You can comment on everything. And <laughs> I just think it, right. But not vote yet, right? No, no not vote, yeah. No, but, and I know from Now your, it won't be as much fun. Exactly. <laughs> your experience as associate member, you certainly have participated, and I believe there's one other position that is an associate member. Yes, um, Both of those positions are very active, so. Yeah, um, very good. I'm glad you're ma making the foray into, you're basically going to be doing the same thing but voting now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I look forward to working with you on the pocket right, Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Yeah, I definitely I want to thank you as well. And I, I wanted to know in particular that you're stepping in, you, as you know, but not everyone else does. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the you have to, there's a scarce resource, which is our playing fields and, and so on and so forth. And you are trying to make hard decisions about how to allocate that scarce resource. And that involves uh, taking some, some, you know, some kind words and also some people who get a little bit upset when they don't get what they want. And so this is a difficult, volunteer position because of that. And I really wanted to acknowledge that and acknowledge the patience and uh, that that takes and thank you for it. Thank you. I think it'll be interesting with the whole CPA piece coming into it now too. So I might be coming in in a real funky spot, but we'll. I agree. See how that goes, looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> thank you very much. Citizens Open Forum. <coughs> Anybody signed up in Citizens Open Forum? Marianne? Yes, Gordon Anybody signed Jameson. Up? Gordon. Howard Jameson. I was going to do that Karnak thing earlier. Where Gordon Jameson. Longest speaker at Selectman's meeting this evening. Mm. Who is Howard Jameson? Gordon. Howard. Gordon. 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 <laughs> Gordon. <laughs> Remedial. It's been so long since you've been here, I forgot, you Gordon. Your name. Well, we can change that. <laughs> <laughs> How may we assist you, sir? Uh, yes, Mr. Greeley. Um, I'm here to uh, just give a quick update on recycling, but particularly comment on Community Collection Day, which is this Saturday from 9 to 1 at the uh, DPW Yard on Grove Street. Um, as the board knows, um, Arlington has done a great job um, collaboration between the committee, the DPW, and the residents in uh, uh, reducing the amount of trash we send to the incinerator in North Andover by over 30% in the last 10 to 12 years, saving us over $2 million over that period of time. So thank you out there to the uh, audience and to the board and to the DPW. Um, we've made great strides in reducing our uh, waste by um, weekly recycling uh, a variety of uh, uh, new, new um, things. We have all these textile bins in town, books and things that people can drop stuff off, and the new monthly recycling center that people can learn about more um, at the uh, website. And we get to the point of the matter here, which is the semi-annual Community Collection Days, which I think this is the 10th fall we've had, had that going on. Um, for information, people are, are best to go to the website. 
<laughs> if you go to the website on your um, little devices, you'll, you'll see that right on the front page, the first uh, picture that shows up is about the Community Collection Day. People can go to the link there and find out that, yes, it is November, Saturday, Saturday, November 14th from 9 to 1. As I always say, don't come early, don't come late. <laughs> um, if you click, click to that link, you'll see that there's a, a couple things beyond the 9 to 1 and the, and the location. Um, people must remember that on that day, during the period of the event, Grove Street is one way in a northbound direction, so you need to loop around and come in from the Mass Ave side. If you come in from the, the other end, that Summer Street is closed. That's pretty much the easy way to say that. There's a wide variety of things that you can't, so, so differential of labors. The <coughs> stuff you can put out on the bin every week, you don't bring to this event. You bring things you can't put out in the recycling bin every week. These can include clean uh, bicycles, gently use, use toys, books and clothing. Now textiles that are really at the end of their life, you should just put in one of the um, Planet Aid bins or bring to Goodwill. Th those will just be work for our staff and volunteers to take care of and there's going to be 600 cars in four hours so imagine how much stuff is there. Um, medical sharps only, drugs go to the uh, public safety department. Uh, people love the paper shredding of private documents. We do ask for a donation to the food pantry so again as I've discussed to this uh, to the board in the past this is a great event because it's fun. The DPW staff, I think, really has a good time. And we do good while we're doing good because a lot of these event things end up in being resale. And there's a whole long list. Sneakers, rigid plastic, foam, scrap metal, rechargeable uh, alkaline batteries go in the regular trash. Um, Rebeamable bottles go to the Save Club. Electronics, there's a charge for that. Um, you can get those big sucker televisions picked up at your door on that Saturday by the DPW, but you need to get your request in by Thursday. No appliances. So go to the website, folks. Um, find the information. Uh, Community Collection Day, November, uh, Saturday, November 14th, 9 to 1. Again, <coughs> don't come early. Don't come late. And enter from the Mass End uh, Ave side. Any questions from the board? Any questions? No. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank see you guys you. on Saturday. All right, buddy. Thanks. Anybody else on the Citizens Open Forum? No. Item 11 for approval handicap parking sign at 12 Lockland Avenue. Linda uh, Papazian, if I'm saying that correct. Is she here? No. She, she was coming. Okay. So. Can you check in the other room? <coughs> Uh, no, I think we'll leave it for now. Okay. Uh, mo motion to table. Move, so moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say by the saying aye. 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 Uh, item 12 for approval. Letter to the governor on the Green Line extension. Howard Muse, chair of the <coughs> Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Uh, as you may have heard uh, through the news and media and so forth, uh, the proposed or the Estimated costs of the Green Line extension through Somerville and Medford um, has experienced a rather large increase in the uh, in the cost estimate. Um, originally, it was about 1.9 million billion dollars, uh, and now, based on some recent bids that came in, it's uh, on the order of up to 2.9 billion dollars, or anywhere from about 700 million to 1 billion dollars more than originally anticipated. Uh, and as a result, there's been a lot of discussion about what would be the fate of the Green Line extension, including the possibility that the project would be halted. Um, and then there are also several items being considered as ways to save money on it, uh, including taking some of the money for the ultimate uh, extension of it to Route 16 and putting that back into the project that takes it to Tufts University. Uh, Supposedly, that would not endanger the ultimate extension of Route 16, but um, it doesn't sound like a, a, a good sign to those of us on the TAC. But in any case, what we wanted to do was have the town uh, reaffirm its commitment to the project and provide that information to the governor and his transportation team and our legislative uh, delegation. Uh, and so we, uh, we prepared a draft letter 
solely for your use if you would like to use it or uh, if you would like to uh, convey that information in some other form. Uh, but we would, uh, it's our recommendation that the town through the Board of Selectmen uh, register their concerns about the uh, financial status of the project and reaffirm our commitment to it um, being completed all the way to Route 16. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Carroll. Yeah, I, I move to uh, authorize and direct the chair to sign the draft letter uh, presented to us uh, on our behalf in support of the, uh, the uh, Green Line extension uh, to West Bedford. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you very Thank much you for very taking much. leadership role in this. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to take a 10-minute <coughs> break, and this meeting is going to move into the Lions hearing room where we will conduct, a, have a discussion on mill mass ave light changes. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to a continuation of the Board of Selectmen's meeting um, on uh, November 9th. Uh, 2015. Uh, I'm Kevin Greeley, Chairman of the Board. To my right we have a member of the Board of Selectmen, Dan Dunn, Joe Kiro from the Board of Selectmen, Diane Mahan, and also Mr. Stephen Byrne from the Board of Selectmen. Next to Stephen, our Town Manager, Adam Chapdelaine. Next to Adam, Marianne Sullivan from, our, from, the, from the Board's office. And next to Marianne is Town Council, Doug Hine. So we have seldom had as much input on an issue especially related to traffic, as we have about this intersection at Mass and Mill. So this board has requested this be put on our agenda this evening, and we've moved in here so that we could make room for all of you, and it seems like we have just enough seats uh, in here for everybody so far. So uh, what this board, based on the number of phone calls, emails, uh, conversations we've had, uh, we, we have asked for this to be put on the agenda, and we have asked uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, our town manager, and his team, and the representatives from TAC, who we first met with on this issue about two years ago, also our director of public works, Michael Rademacher, to be here tonight. And so we're gonna first ask that they, we're gonna ask a, a series of five questions we'd like to have them answer. Then we will take public input. After the public input, it will come back to the Board of Selectmen, and we'll see whether any of the members of the Board of Selectmen would like to make uh, any changes to the traffic rules and order. So to that end, um, and please, my colleagues, if uh, this isn't an accurate reflection, please um, um, correct me. So first, what we'd like to ask is, you know, what has been done? What are the changes that have been made here at Mass and Mill? Why have those changes been made? What has been our experience so far? What about the concerns about safety, uh, and certainly traffic and pedestrian safety there, and also uh, issues re related to uh, handicapped uh, individuals crossing at that intersection? So to, let me hand it from here to Adam Chapdelaine. He'll take it over from here. Adam. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just so everybody's aware, including the members of Tag. I don't think we have amplification, so we'll all uh, have to speak up during this uh, discussion as, as best possible. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, there's not much more I would add other than echoing. Uh, this has certainly been an item on which I know I have received, I know the board has received, uh, my office and the board's office have received uh, a great deal of feedback and concern raised in regards to the matter. Uh, that said, I think the questions uh, that the chairman has laid out will give uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee and also uh, Public Works an opportunity to explain what has happened, uh, the reasons be behind why the changes were made, uh, and then also try to address some of the uh, concerns that were brought forth. So with that, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay with you, I'd ask uh, Jeff Max Tudis, Chair of uh, TAC, to begin answering some of those questions. It's right, right, right in front. Oh, well, you've got to come up to here, though, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he likes his seat. Can you blame him? So the microphones are for the millions watching at home, so that's why in a moment when we ask for public input, we're going to ask you to line up behind that microphone. But Jeff, next to you first. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Board of Selectmen. Uh, with, uh, with me tonight is um, Jason Sobel, a professional traffic engineer 
who consulted on this job, both to TAC and to DPW on the design of this intersection. Howard Muse is also here. So I'll go through the questions as, as stated, and you can interrupt me at, at any time for any questions, and I'll give uh, responses uh, the best of my knowledge. Um, so what changes have been made to the intersection? Um, so this goes back a couple years, uh, mitigation money based on CBS um, project uh, for this intersection. The traffic controller, which was quite old um, at the time, was replaced. So there's a new traffic controller as part of this project out there. There's new pedestrian uh, countdown signals and audi audible uh, signals also at the intersection. Um, there is a new left turn uh, beacon for eastbound Mass Avenue at the intersection. Uh, there are new lane designations uh, on Mill and Jason Street um, to designate the, the operations of those lanes. Um, let's see, the width of Jason Street approach was slightly modified. The island was uh, narrowed slightly to try to um, create a two-lane vehicle approach to that intersection. And um, I think that's, those, are, those are the changes that have been implemented so far. So I want to say that the, ch the change in this, of course, the signal timings um, and phasing were changed to allow uh, split the um, Jason and Mill Street approaches. Uh, previously, they were running at the same time, um, which led to a high uh, accident rate uh, at those locations, higher than the average uh, mass DOT district and statewide uh, uh, crash rates and uh, that was previously a pedestrian phase and was changed to a concurrent, uh, concurrent phase where pedestrians are uh, operating a crossing uh, concurrently with the uh, uh, traffic. What's uh, with that is a lead pedestrian phase, a lead pedestrian interval, so pedestrians get about a four second uh, advance uh, crossing the intersection uh, before, before traffic moves um, with them concurrently. Um, so initially, a uh, couple, couple items. The, the, the incorrect timings were installed initially at the intersection, so it was not uh, working correctly at, uh, initially at that intersection. Um, I understand those have since been um, corrected, so those, the times as designed are in there. Um, also, the pedestrians, uh, the pedestrian phases are coming on automatically. Uh, each phase, it's not supposed to operate that way. It's supposed to operate on a push button uh, when pedestrians are there pushing the button. So it's not operating that way, which is uh, making it less efficient uh, for uh, traffic. Um, we understand that some of the pedestrian buttons are broken and have to be repaired, so they, they can't operate as, uh, as intended or designed until those buttons are, are fixed at that intersection. So right now it's it's operating every, every phase. If it didn't come up every phase, there'd be some additional green time, which would make the traffic a little more efficient than it is today. So it's not operating exactly as, as it was intended. Can I ask just one question on the subject you just touched on? Yeah. If you know, um, you indicated that um, because of traffic accidents before, uh, J Mill Street and Jason Street both went at the same time. Right. You indicated now that they're staggered because of the number of traffic accidents. Do you know what number you're referencing? Because I'm trying to think of yeah. that occasion. Yeah, between um, 2009 and June 2012, I think a three and a half year period, I think there were 27 accidents reported. Mm -hmm. Do you know the nature of them, fender bender? Um, there's a com was a combination. It's mo I think they're mostly angle angle accidents because of the so last. The right of way is unclear when they run together because the intersection's offset, mm -hmm. so it's not clear when someone's turning or drive driving through. So there was a lot of angle uh, collisions there. Mm -hmm. There's some rear end collisions also. In in the island on Jason Street, um, just when I've I've gone down it, it's very rare that there actually are two lanes um, coming down Jason Street, crossing over Mass Ave to Mill. Um, is there any thought to somehow doing something else so that you actually can get two lanes there, or what we have is what we have? Yeah, um, yeah of course, you know, it's, it's tight at that intersection. Um, so you can probably, inc you know, <coughs> re we like to keep the island um, 
for, you know, to separate traffic. But if you could reduce the island, you can get probably a few more cars, but you can't extend it back very far onto Jason Street. So even if you did that, you can maybe stack four or five vehicles in two lanes maximum. But after that, the, nar the road's going to narrow down, and you're not going to get that two million effect. So it's really just for stacking at the at the approach at that intersection, not so much as a, a you know an official you know two lane going across the intersection. Thank you, D um, Jeff. Do you have any data on accidents since this is t since the change? Is it two months? I I I, I don't have any. Yeah. I, I, do you, sir? Oh, okay. Like His eyes open yeah. wide. It's like, don't look at me. No. <laughs> okay. About a month and a half. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. A little louder, if you could, please. Okay. Sorry. That's yep. just the back of the room. Yep. So um, the attack is very concerned at this intersection. I don't think it's, it's operating as it was intended, obviously, on, on several fronts. Um, there are, unfortunately, some, there were some issues um, beginning with the tr you know, signal timings. The PED buttons are broken. It's not operating as it was intended. So, unfortunately, that's not as it was designed. Uh, we understand the public's concern about conflicts of pedestrians and traffic, and it's a difficult location. Um, we did the study about two years ago um, to try to have a balanced approach. Um, one thing I want to mention is the exclusive pedestrian phase previously was not up to standard. So there was, there was not enough time um, based on industry standards, state standards to cross. There was about 21 seconds. So we had to increase, if you, you had to increase that time. That was one of the decisions we were looking at at a challenging intersection. Can we do, can we do concurrent um, to try to protect the pedestrians with the lead phase going across Eliminating those to right right turn conflicts on Jason and Mill, Mass Ave. We still have the left turning turning conflicts uh, at that location, so we are trying to um, improve um, safety. But we're realizing there there are some issues at this intersections, and it's not uh, working as well as intended. So we're we're concerned also. Anything else? Or the the there handicap. Any, anything that you miss? I, uh, the handicap. Are yeah. they working properly? Is there uh, no, those no. visually impaired? Uh, because the because some of the ped buttons are not working. Um, that includes the the audible messages um, to cross the intersection. So okay. some some of those are not working properly, as I understand it. Okay. Questions from the board? No. Nope. I'd like to hear from the residents, I think. You'd like to hear what? I'd like to hear the rest of the presentation in public. Right. Yeah, I'd like to hear from the residents. Yeah, right, but I, I'm asking if there's any questions from this board to Jeff at this point. Oh, no, sorry. No? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I have one question to the manager. I mean, what do we have a time frame for um, repairing the buttons and the signals? Because that seems to be a key. I defer to okay. Public Works for that. OK. So. What did you just say? Sorry? I, I mean, my, I don't know if Mike has an answer here. Yeah, okay. Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Sure, thank you. Uh, so, from my understanding, there are two pedestrian buttons that were damaged during the changeover. They were either fried or some wires crossed. They're out for repair. Uh, we don't have a, a time to re um, return on those, but we are looking to buy some sooner than waiting for those to be repaired. And we can replace those, and then we'd have the others as spare uh, in case something happens. So we are working to make purchase some new buttons and not wait for the others to be replaced. And yeah. just to follow, how many of the audible signals are out? Well, the, so not to be confusing, that there there are buttons. Uh, when you press them, they indicate which crosswalk has the okay. has the signal. Yeah. Those are what's out. The audible signal that chirps to to indicate that you took the, from the far side of the crossing that you can cross, I believe those are operational. It's the buttons that have the voice, the electronic voice that say cross Mass Ave, cross Jason Street. Those, those are the buttons that are up. Thank you. Couple. Ms. Um, Mahan. Kind of hate to put you on the spot, but um, I, I just would ask um, what reservations, if any, would um, 
you have, Jeff, or, or TAC, in terms of um, restoring the original uh, traffic pedestrian pattern in terms of pedestrians when they cross, there are no cars that they have to um, sort of battle with, and or why did we install this here? Um, are we planning on doing it anywhere in the future, which I hope we're not. So what I would like to know is if for some reason I made a motion that, um, you know, hearing from a lot of the community down there, especially being at the high school a lot, that um, in concert with all the other traffic signals in Arlington, we do not have pedestrians crossing um, at the same time that traffic is turning. Um, what, what would be? Right, I think, I think there's a couple locations in town, but more, more minor locations, like the, the Concord Turnpike. Um, uh, there might be another one, but not on Mass Ave, right. of course. But, but in terms of this location, if it, say I made a motion that we revert back to, originally my idea was that we did do the lane markings so that you know we have a straight and a left, and we have a straight and a right. Right. Um, not that we have um, a three to five second delay pedestrian cr crossing and then traffic turning. So um, right. say I made a motion to restore it that it goes back to in concert with all the other signals on Mass Ave that pedestrians don't have to sort of encounter vehicles and vice versa. Um, would you be totally and or attack adverse? No, I mean, uh, <coughs> we're in favor of whatever the safest operation is. So if people are avoiding that intersection and it's not working for them, then okay. you know, of course we would support that. Um, the, di the difference would be if we go back to the, uh, the previous operation, so the, the exclusive PED phase will be a little bit longer than it was before. Mm -hmm. I think it was 21 seconds, so we go up to 27. 27, so the, de the delays uh, in queuing would be a little bit worse um, for the intersection as a whole. Um, but the pedestrian safety would be more um, protected. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes, Mr. Carroll. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. That just came oh, to mind. Did I think the, ahead of you? No, you no, didn't. No, you no. didn't. No, you actually sparked another question. Um, I think that what Ms. Mahan has put forward was what uh, TAC originally put forward is Bill, uh, Bill 3, which, which, which had all of the modifications that have happened now, but um, maintained a separate phase. Um, are the exclusive pedestrian phase. Um, and as I'm reading it, this was rejected because um, of the level of service. So it was estimated that the AM peak hour would be over 120 seconds, so over two minutes, and same in the PM peak hour. Um, so there were also projections in there for what we have now uh, that we've just implemented, uh, 68 seconds during the AM peak hour, 76 during the PM. Have we gone out and measured that to, to see if, if the projections are actually um, being realized in reality? Uh, I, I don't know that. I don't know if Mike, yeah. if, if that has been done yet. Yeah, okay. The, um, I just want to want make clear, so um, Diane, were you asking to go with the split phases and the exclusive pedestrian phase or the way it was before? The way it was before. Okay, Dead. right, right. Traffic, Jason Mill. Both go at the same time, but with the lane markings, right. so it handles the traffic flow, and that pedestrian crossing go from 21 to 27 seconds exclusively with no traffic encounters. Right. I think what uh, Mr. 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 Kiro, Mr. Kiro is referring to. Uh, we, I didn't go over the. You know, we did an analysis two years ago. We evaluated a half a dozen scenarios. So scenario three, I think, was with the split phases and an exclusive pedestrian phase. Um, in that case, we would have even longer delays in, in queuing. Mm -hmm. So that, that, was, that was rejected at the time. I didn't need to no, that's all right. That's what we're here for. Any, any other questions from the colleagues at this point? Okay. Thank you. Adam, question? Oh. That's, the, that, that's the list of those who have signed in. What, oh, okay, oh, like six, I, I didn't realize we have, we, I didn't realize we have a list, okay. Thank you, Jeff. So I'll call on these as I, as I have been uh, here in front of me, and I assume these were signed in at the uh, same time. You, you may say pass when I call on you, or you can come on up to this microphone and speak. You're not first. I know I'm not first, I'm second. Yeah. <laughs> right. But we would, we would like to come up as a group. <laughs> okay. I, I don't so is Donna one of these? Is Donna? Yes. 
Come on up as a group, please. So this is Donna, Christine, and Cara. Yes. Am I correct? Okay. I know it's Christine, sorry. Welcome, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Donna Moore, and I live at 15 Jason Street. I'm Cara Madden, I live at 71 Cutter Hill Road. And I'm Christine Carney, I live at 98 Richfield Road. And Chairman and members of the board uh, and others who are here, the citizens of Arlington have expressed overwhelming concern about the new configuration at the Jason Street Mill Street Mass Ave intersection. In just six days, over 700 motorists, cyclists, and pedestrians who drive, bike, and walk in Arlington Center have signed a petition asking the Board of Selectmen to, re to return this intersection to an exclusive pedestrian crossing. Well over 300 people have also left comments describing their concern, as well as their personal experiences of the dangers of this current crossing. In addition to the petition, uh, petition and comments, we're also we're going to be giving to you, uh, we also have a handout that highlights some key points regarding why the intersection needs to be returned to an exclusive pedestrian crossing that Kara will be discussing. And we'd like to give these documents to you now. Can I pass them up to you or just give them to Mary? Yeah, just give them, still pass them along. Really? Thank you, Christy. Um, I'll start talking more going through these. Um, I know this intersection very well. In fact, the only car accident I've ever had in my life was here. It was six years ago this December. I actually never saw the car hit that day. It was the classic turning left off of Mill Street. The police officer had to tell me what happened, and we both left in ambulances. If I had hit a pedestrian that day, rather than another car, I have no doubt I would have killed that person. Um, I hope by taking action, you can keep my personal fear from becoming our community's reality. Uh, please, restore exclusive pedestrian crossing at this intersection. This is an urgent situation. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I, I really feel very strongly about this. Um, on behalf of our group that created the petition, we'd like to share our following concerns. One is that the changes that you approved in May 2013 don't match the actual changes we're seeing here. Uh, the 2013 vote didn't include allowing vehicles to make left turns from Mass Ave into crossing pedestrians, nor did it mention that pedestrians would be crossing Mass Ave east and west sides at different times. This has added an extra level of chaos to this intersection that isn't needed, and we're concerned about how those changes are made after the fact. Our second concern is that the changes put in place don't meet the criteria for concurrent crossing that was recommended by the Boston Metropolitan Regional Planning Organization in 2015. The type of crossing we're seeing in place now is only recommended for intersections with a low number of conflicting vehicle turns. Simple intersections with good sight distances, intersections with a low number of pedestrians needing special protection, and they go on to elaborate. That means older pedestrians, students, very young children, and those with disabilities, as well as intersections that see low to moderate pedestrian volumes. The research we've done as a group indicates that this intersection does not qualify for concurrent crossing. None of this criteria is met. Most remarkably, by our own calculations, these crosswalks potentially serve nearly 4,000 people in our own community who need special protection. We looked at the number of seniors and people with disabilities who lived around here. We looked at the number of preschools and the number of students. There's a lot. Um, and TAC themselves have said that the offset geometry of Mill and Jason Streets creates a confusing and hazardous situation. What's happened since signaling was changed here? The comments from our petition tell the stories of the negative and potentially life-threatening consequences. At least by anecdotal standards, the level of service has not improved for vehicles on Mass Ave or Mill Street. Personal anecdotes, both in the petition and in Arlington List discussions, held numerous near misses between vehicles and pedestrians. Business owners have begun expressing concerns about a potential loss of clientele, and adjoining neighborhoods are reporting increased levels of cut through traffic. Mm -hmm. Overall safety has not been improved as a result of TAC's recommendations. We implore you to please return this, at this intersection to exclusive pedestrian crossing until further research can be done. Like you, we love living here, but we don't want to see another um, pedestrian fatality in Arlington. Thank you. They didn't hear a word of that at home. Will you please repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Christine, yeah, no? No, no, no. no. Okay, yep. yes, go ahead, Dan. Uh, so, uh, with, I, I, I clearly heard the call to come back to the pedestrian only. Uh, were you similarly asking to come back to the opposing left-hand turn? I've heard, the, what we've heard is that <coughs> cars prefer that, and I can say my accident would have been, wouldn't have happened, that it existed. I, uh, I'm, honestly, I'm here to, uh, it's to support pedestrians because I feel like they're the most vulnerable group. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a clear answer for you on that. I, I, I don't mind the new okay, well you lane. You've got to come to the mic, sorry, I'm sorry. I don't mind the new lane designation. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's right. working. Yes. Um, it's a solo pedestrian. It's pedestrians. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, you three. Uh, Barbara McCauley. <clears throat> Excuse me. Barbara McCauley, I live at 1184 Mass Ave. I'm here because I have a family member who is profoundly deaf and also has difficulty processing conflicting information like uh, concurrent pa patterns. And he walks through this intersection um, twice a day, every day, and I'm really, really afraid for his safety. So, thank you. So, may I ask? Mm -hmm. So, what's what's different now? What's uh, different now the, is I mean, the just traffic that the cars is, can cross. Right, and he used right. to walk up and he sees the green light for traffic and the white light for pedestrians, okay. and it's like. Not only is it not safe because he can't hear a car coming up behind him, but it's like, what do I do? Okay, okay. thank you very much. Laura Wierkakala? Wierkala. Wierkala, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name's Laura Wierkala. I live at 1292 Mass Ave. I also have a business at that intersection at 785 Mass Ave, Laura's Sewing School. It's right on that building, mm -hmm. the upper corner building. And I'm there all day. Every day. So, if you want anyone who's observed what's going on, talk to me because I see it. I hear the honking. <coughs> there is so much honking going on. It's like even if I'm not looking, oh, the light must be, you know, red for them. You know, I'm hearing it all the time. I hear from all my students that they are really having a hard time with crossing the street safely. They're often carrying or pulling sewing machines with them, that fabric, lots of things, and they have. Um, drivers not only honking, but giving them rude gestures. Yesterday, we had a strategy meeting at my shop, and both me and another person uh, found cars turning right in front of us as we were trying to cross this mess out. I was two, uh, three quarters of the way across, and this guy tried to turn in front of me. And I was like, you know, what do you think you're doing? You know, and he did stop, but it was dangerous. And I would like to see that changed because it's just going to happen that someone's going to get hurt terribly. Another thing is, is that I don't think anyone's really touched on this this evening, but I think it was a mistake to change the left turn signal for the eastbound Mass Ave traffic. Before what would happen, the left turn signal was before the, the oncoming traffic could turn. So the left turn people got out of the way. That meant both lanes could go straight. Um, I have found, because I drive there and I'm a pedestrian, that um, often it gets backed way, way up because people who want to turn left are stuck in that lane. And then they're also trying to cut in front of oncoming traffic, which also means that they might be trying to cut and then not notice that there are pedestrians in the crosswalk. It's a much worse situation. A lot of people, I talked to other business owners in my block. I was uh, talking with a pizza place owner, and he said, I hate it. It's a big problem. I signed the petition. The guy, the guy who um, has the dress shop, the, the um, tailoring shop, he said he was in an accident two days ago, totaled his car at, at that intersection. So even though you don't have any um, uh, data yet on accidents, he said it was because of the turning and some other things. He, he, he implied it was because of the changes in the intersection. So I really urge you to consider going back to the way it was because it was working much better. The other thing is that in the lane designations, when you're coming down Jason Street, you can go straight or left in the left-hand lane and it's a right turn lane. One of the problems coming up Mill Street is that straight and right turn are in the same lane and left turn is the other lane. If you're gonna have the Jason Street and the Mill Street traffic go at separate times, it makes more sense to put the left and straight in the left-hand lane if you have to do designations like that, like Jason Street is right now, because everyone gets stuck behind the right-hand people. 
But of course, that shouldn't be a problem because we hope that you're going to change it back to pedestrian only. You know, but I just wanted to give you that feedback. But I see it every day, all day, and it's been a wreck. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Adam Elich. Hi, I'm Adam Ehrlich, 741A, Mass App. That's okay. Uh, I want to thank the Board of Selectmen for evaluating this issue, and, and I also want to thank Donna and the folks sitting over there for uh, helping to mobilize the community. Um, I, I live right near this intersection. I've got a family, a three and a five year old child, and we cross that intersection several times a, a week. And I, I had oral surgery just a few hours ago, so I can't get too excited because the doctor warned me blood might start <laughs> gushing out of my mouth. But, but, and he warned me actually against even coming here for this. Uh, he said I should be laying so you're down. Admitting you're drugged when you hear me. No drugs whatsoever, actually. Um, just pain. Yeah, yeah. It's just pain, yeah. But, but he said I should be laying down and icing my mouth, and th I, I had to be here because I, I feel like my family's in danger. And it's not just my family. I, I live in the condo complex at that corner, and everybody in the complex is concerned. We have a, a large number of the people from the community um, here because they cross the intersection like we do and they're afraid. <coughs> uh, the most recent example of where we were almost killed um, was Halloween. We were trick-or-treating up Jason Street, a great place to go trick-or-treating. The girls were dressed as a witch and a man-eating uh, cupcake. And you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was dressed as thing two. <laughs> so so we were we were wearing costumes. It should be visible. The people should be looking out for families. And and the girls even had lights on. Um, and you know my daughters were there. They were raring to cross the intersection. I was holding their hands. The light turned white with the hand so we could cross. And I was ready to take a step. And just as I was about to do it, a car whizzed around the corner and almost killed all three of us on Halloween. Um, it wouldn't have been good. Um, and e even before that, I was afraid. But after almost having my, you know, not entire family, my wife wasn't with me. She was a little further away. Um, but it, it, was, it, it really brought it home that this is dangerous. And personally, I think the most dangerous part of it is maybe not even where we were killed, almost killed, um, is cars whizzing down Jason Street um, and then taking the right at about like 9, 10 o'clock at night where there's lots of pedestrians who are still crossing that intersection. I kind of like four or five one evening at about 9. Um, and the cars build up a lot of speed going down the hill. And I've actually videotaped it from my car just to see what it looked like. And there are trees and buildings that obstruct the view of that intersection. And a lot of times there's a car at the base of, of the hill. So you can't see anything in the intersection. So you could be doing about 30, 35 miles an hour as you hit the intersection, your light's green, and you turn the corner. And I've got a, a video that I sent to Adam Chapdelaine showing exactly that. And you don't see the crosswalk until you dr literally drive across it. And the problem with the light is that pedestrians assume that they're safe in that intersection. And being a driver, if your light's green, you assume that you can go at you know, the, the speed limit, which is probably 30 miles an hour, and then you know Mass Ave is two lanes, so you can make a wide turn, and you could be surprised by a pedestrian standing there. That, that, that I think, is the most dangerous thing. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I think the key, it sounds like everybody's sort of leaning towards making a change. Um, but what I want to stress is that there's some urgency to this. That if, if we don't make this change soon, somebody will get seriously injured and potentially die. Um, and, and if you look at the petition, and you should look at the petition, there are numerous instances like my, my family where we were almost hit, you know, you know, walking in a stroller in the middle of the intersection. Uh, hundreds of them. I mean, there's 700 people who signed up. 300 gave you know, examples of where, where bad things happened to them, like what I, I just gave you. And, if we don't do something soon, something bad is going to happen. I think. Um, and it, it sounds like, once again, that people are leaning this way. And I appreciate the, the board uh, listening to people talking about the dangers associated with the intersection and the mobilization of the community. Um, but, but we need to do something soon. 
That, that's the key thing, because it would be horrible if, uh, if, if something did happen that was bad, um, and, and we'd all regret the fact that we didn't do something sooner. So I appreciate you, you taking the action and helping us to, to rectify the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Dosha. As you may recall, uh, back in uh, May of 2012, I came before the board requesting some changes at the intersection in terms of giving Mill Street its own signal and Jason Street its own because during the commuting hours, four cars would make a left turn off of Mill Street, the other 10 remained. And uh, it's done in many places, we know that. But I was assuming that we would perhaps do it a little differently with its own pedestrian signal, and that the loops, underground loops, would control the cycle time. In other words, if you go out there now, and you miss the light going north on west on Mass Ave, whatever it is, you'll wait three minutes and 20 seconds for the next one, and you'll sit there and say, what's happening here because there's no one on Mill Street, but you have to wait for that whole signal. Nobody's on Jason Street, goes next, you wait the whole signal. They stack up on Mass Ave. I've come out of here at 9 o'clock at night and couldn't get to take a left out of the back, uh, Academy Street and we'd get down around the other way. Now, the, uh, what we have uh, is, is not that. In the, the root of the problem is really linking the pedestrian light to the traffic light. And often what you see, and they, they, it's been pointed out here, Coming down Jason Street, what you'll see is it's a tight one. You can't really get two lanes in there. But the, if there's somebody crossing, the person that wants to turn, turn right has to stop, and as a result, no one goes through until the pedestrian is cleared. And um, so if we are all on, if there was a separate pedestrian light, they would all clear, everybody would clear. And like I say, you wouldn't have to sit there 30, 40, 50 seconds at times when there's no one on the other streets, the cycle would just, it would just nobody there, go to the next cycle, go to the next cycle. That, that's the basic problem. And as I said, the full cycle is three minutes and 15 <coughs> seconds from the time you get the go on Mass Ave till you get the next go on Mass Ave. Um, Arlington Center is um, one minute and 50 seconds. Did, did you actually time this, Bob? Yes, I did. Okay. I, I did I, two, and it wasn't three minutes, but go ahead. I, I, got, I got three minutes, and I did it three times. Once was 3.18, once was okay, go ahead. 3.10, but it's okay. over three minutes. All right, Depending go, on go. the time, I think they might do some different things during different parts of the day, but this is during the commuting point, and down the center, like I say. So this is almost, not twice as much, but much for a, a busy intersection, and I think we need some better lighting down there so that people can see what's going on there. 5.30 at night, it is ugly, uh, believe me. I, I stand on the corner and I watch it. And, you know, people are trying to cross and the lights aren't clear. Get, get the pedestrian light on its own. Don't worry about the timing because if there's nobody there, you'll go on to the next cycle quickly. Nobody's going to be stacked up. And what it's caused also is people going off to the side streets now because they're stacked up on Mass Ave waiting for nobody to go on the others. And they're coming up Academy Street. I followed six cars up there the other day just to see where they were going. And they went up over to Irvine, R Ravine, I think it was, and then on to Jason, and then uh, out to Route 2. So they're not waiting there. They don't want to wait down at the center, so they'll come up here to do it. And uh, the same thing coming down the other way. Um, the other morning, it was backed up to the high school, and people were turning off onto Bartlett Ave to go up to loop around somehow, get around whatever they were getting around. So. Uh, I'm, I'm all for letting the underground detectors determine when the lights should come on and off and give the pedestrians their own separate signal with better lighting. Okay? Thank you. Amanda Calabro. Was that a pass? May God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, we are. I mean, we're all hearing the same arguments again and again. Thank you, and that's important. And anybody who signed up, you're more than welcome to speak. Uh, Hossam Ali. Yes. Uh, 
Thank you very much for having me and uh, for having this forum to have our input. Um, I am, I live in 6A Bacon Street and um, I use um, Mills and Mass. I turn uh, left on Mass Avenue and I'm very uh, grateful for that sign for us. Uh, but also I'm here to uh, support our pedestrians. Um, I don't mind to wait a little bit for him, for them uh, to actually pass and cross um, and also support uh, lighting uh, for uh, a good lighting for this uh, intersection. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tom Brown. Tom, how you've changed. <laughs> <laughs> Change. I'm Paula Herman. I'm Tom Brown's wife. He had to leave early because oh. it was a long time. Sorry. He is blind and was happy, was able to cross before, and he is terribly confused. And yes, there are uh, auditory signals, but with traffic, even the ones that work, are he can't hear them. So he's having a terrible time doing it and I appreciate what agree with what other people have said but I just wanted to add it. thank you very much ma'am Peter Fuller well, thank you mr. chairman Peter Fuller of seven Kilsyth Road up in the Heights um, I'm here to draw your attention to possible effects of the Arlington Center parking improvement plan that is underway with the intersection. Um, when the parking plan is implemented, we're going to see parking meters east of the intersection on Mass Ave, Court Street, library, parking lot, and so on. There will be no meters west of the intersection. I think we may see drivers when those meters are in place, particularly people coming down from the heights, you know, following human nature and looking to park where it's free, west of the intersection and not where they have to pay east of the intersection. That may cause an increase in pedestrian traffic, people wanting to do business at town hall, library, post office may park up west and walk across the intersection. So there's more pedestrians. Uh, that could cut both ways. There's safety in numbers. If more people are crossing, they're more easily seen. Mm. But it could also increase the number of pedestrian vehicle conflicts, which, you know, often don't end well for the pedestrian. For the so, pedestrian, yeah. So I guess I just ask that, you know, when you decide what to do or what you don't want to do with the intersection, take the parking plan into account. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Jessica Dombrowski. Um, I was going to pass because I think, you know, especially the straight left turn lane coming off of Mills that already talked about and the exclusive pedestrian crossing. So my other points are all taken. <coughs> Thank you, Jessica. Patricia Warden. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight about this deteriorated intersection situation. And thank you to the Transportation Advisory Committee for their recommendation to change lane designations to improve the vehicular left turns into Massachusetts Avenue from Jason Street and Mill Street. I'm not talking about the left turns from Massachusetts Avenue into Jason and Mill Streets, which your pedestrian signal changes have now made very dangerous for pedestrians. The change for pedestrians at this intersection involving removal of the dedicated vehicle-free exclusive pedestrian crossing interval is a disaster. <coughs> and that dedicated crossing should be reinstated immediately. During summer, before I left for vacation at the end of August, we noticed that the left turns from Jason and Mill Streets into Massachusetts Avenue uh, had been improved. When I got back from vacation in September, after a long flight, I was as stiff as a board. 
And so the first thing I did was go for a walk. As I got near the Massachusetts Avenue crossing at Jason Street, I noticed Barbara and Alan Tosti there looking quite worried. The pedestrian light and audio signals were bizarre. The three of us tried to find a safe part of the light cycle for pedestrians to cross, but we couldn't. Alan then saw a policeman nearby and went off to report to him that the signals for the pedestrian crossing were not functioning properly. That was two months ago, and the situation has not improved. And what will it be like when the snow comes? Until September, ever since I can remember, that exclusive pedestrian crossing has been used with no problems by children, disabled persons, seniors with walkers, and blind people. Since the removal of the exclusive pedestrian interval, pedestrians are forced to accept high risk, and many find it terrifying to cross the intersection and ha have had to go elsewhere on the avenue to cross. Pedestrians now are forced to the intersection with turning vehicular traffic on the crosswalk, except for a few seconds. The arrangement is so clumsy and inefficient, however, that drivers are experiencing longer delays and so that no one is benefiting from the new arrangement and pedestrians are put in harm's way. Those of us who have children or grandchildren and teach children to cross streets safely cannot do so at this intersection. Until September, it was relatively easy. Have the child press a button and wait for the walk light, check that the traffic has stopped, and walk to the other side. Now, however, what does one do? Have the child press the button, wait for the walk light, check that the traffic has stopped, and Run, 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 as fast as they can. They have three seconds before vehicles can start driving across the crosswalk. Many of those drivers see only that they have the green light. They may not see the walk sign. They may not see the child. They may have their eyes fixed only on the green light for them. And can seniors with walkers make the dash in three seconds? Drivers with the green light often are not willing to wait for slow walkers to cross. And so they drive through the crosswalk in front of or behind them, which can be very frightening and confusing to elderly persons. The removal of the exclusive pedestrian crossing is not only endangering the safety of pedestrians, but can have lifelong tragic consequences of guilt and remorse for drivers who might injure a pedestrian in this situation where they can turn into a crosswalk during the walk cycle and may not see the pedestrian in it. My grandfather accidentally injured a pedestrian while driving. He never drove again for his entire life. Do we really need a survival of the fittest situation for pedestrians at this intersection? What we need is a recognition that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The original safe exclusive configuration should be returned immediately. So, in conclusion, you the Board of Selectmen are the only ones who have the power to establish traffic rules here. No one else, not the Traffic Advisory Committee, 
Their role is only advisory, as their title states. It is only your vote that matters. Heavy is the burden on the head that wears the crown. That's you, of course. But in this case, it's not a very heavy burden because the solution to the problem is easy. Prior to September, the exclusive pedestrian traffic signals were working well and keeping pedestrians safe. The pedestrian signals are not working well now to keep pedestrians safe. So simply return the signals to the safety of the exclusive pedestrian interval we had prior to September. And that's the end of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe I'm reading your handwriting. Maureen Bollier. That were mentioned here are my concerns. I actually don't even live in Arlington, but I do attend Laura's class, mm. and so it is an issue, and especially at night. And the, the idea about the lighting also is a big issue there at 10 o'clock at night when we get out of class. So. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Nancy Knopf. Yeah, I will pass as well. God bless. God bless all of you, by the way. <laughs> uh, Kate Crohan. Am I saying that right, Kate? Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your attention. I don't want to be redundant either, but I also decided I can't be magnanimous enough to just pass. <laughs> <laughs> but I will probably change a lot of what I was going to say because it is repetitious and so many people have so many more facts about changes so that I don't have. But my overall, my overarching opinion is that we can no longer rely on the safety of a walk light. And I guess to, to um, emphasize that, I'll describe the first time I came upon the light at Jason and Mill and Mass Ave. I had taken an Uber um, ride from work, which I don't often do, but I do once in a while. And he went the wrong way, and there was so much traffic on Mass Ave. I said, forget it. I'm just going to get out, and I'll walk, and I'm totally OK. So I got out and pressed the button stepped into the street and I thought, oh my God, you know, like, am I crossing at a diagonal without realizing it? Am I at the wrong street and I don't realize where I really am? And so I jumped back on the curb. Then somebody else came along, so we crossed together. Well, later on in the evening, after going to the bank, the gym, awake, I came back, I went to Whole Foods. I don't know how I got across, but I did. Mm -hmm. But when I was coming from Whole Foods, it was around 9.30, and I have to say that I have flashlights. I keep one in front, one in back. I have a reflective vest, which I wasn't wearing, but I was wearing a white jacket. So I am, and I obviously carry a cane, so I'm sure I was pretty <coughs> visible. And I stepped into the street and dashed back on the curb because the, you know, the lane to my left was, um, had no moving traffic when I stepped in, but as soon as I was a little bit into the street, traffic seemed to be everywhere. I did that three times. So finally I thought, either I'm gonna stand on this curb all night, or I'm gonna call somebody to pick me up, or I'm gonna take a risk and try to get home. So obviously I made that decision, started across, and I honestly, in my adult life, I don't think I have ever been as terrified crossing a street. Because I, um, when I was in the middle of the street, I felt like there were cars going in front of me, cars going behind me. I didn't have a clue as to what was going on. Finally, my kid said to me later on when I was describing, how did you ever get across? I said, someone on Mill Street, and tonight I realize who that is, said I could cross, and so I continued. And honestly, I thought I was going to have PTSD about crossing streets after that. And I walk everywhere, everywhere but it was just terrifying. So anyway, I don't think though it's a blindness issue, except that obviously I couldn't see what was going on. And I know now that the audible signal is not in sync with the light. And I, I actually questioned that. I called the police as soon as I finally got across both streets. I threw my groceries down on the curb and used my cell phone and called the police. 
And then the next day, talked to the engineer from the town. And, and so, and it still wasn't totally clear to me until over the weekend when I finally crossed again that it was also an audible signal issue. But anyway, I've been abo avoiding the street like the plague. I actually stopped someone last week who was ahead of me and said, could I cross with you? One time when I was at, at Whole Foods, I met somebody I knew. He said, do you want to ride? I would never do that. It was a gorgeous day. I love walking. And I said, yes, because I don't want to cross that street. Um, I know it's, I know it's um, obviously based on the petition. And I'm so grateful that people put that on, that you, know, you put that online. Um, I know that it's a huge issue for everybody because people have stopped me on the street and said, what do you do? I'm afraid to cross that street and I can see. I talked to somebody at Whole Foods who said that when she brings her, when she walks with her several children, that she's afraid, given that they have the walk light initially, that one of her kids will dart out and then get hit. Um, and obviously, that's a heavily trafficked area with the restaurants and, you know, the church and um, high school and preschool and people from Mill Street who shop and walk up to Mass Ave, people who come from the bike path. Um, it's just, you know, I think it's a hugely, highly trafficked area that, and, and it just needs to become a safer pedestrian crossing again. I, you know, I think given the way drivers are now, there's no safe crossing ever. So we don't need to do something to ensure that it's not safe. Um, and um, I just think traffic flow can't be alleviated at the expense of the safety of pedestrians and that common sense needs to prevail. We need a walkable city. We need more walkable cities. Um, the change shouldn't be delayed. And a plan for change, no matter how long it was in the making, does not have to rule the day. So change it back to the safer intersection that it used to be. And thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Eddie Donahue. Uh, Jerry Cassidy. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time with us. Uh, all the negativity that I'm hearing about this uh, crosswalk and all, no one's really come out to say anything positive about it, and I'm here to do that. Uh, basically, my first encounter with it was about a month and a half ago. And I usually go for a quick run at night, 9, 9.30, so it's kind of dark. And so as I crossed, I came down, I'm at 15 Jason, so coming down Jason Street, I crossed Mass Ave. And as I get the light to cross, which is fine, I'm walking across, not expecting to see a car crossing in front of me, which it did. And so I'm like, what the heck is going on? The woman hardly saw me. She did. I held my hands out right by the hood of the car. And so she rolled down the window, and she's using some language that I never heard in 12 years of Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard those words before. And so she's pointing to the light, the green light. And I'm pointing to the walk sign. And if I had a photographer there to see that photo, like we're both going like, yeah, yeah, what's going on? And that's when I knew that there was a change that had, had taken place. Um, so the, the positive that I get out of this, I'm meeting new people, you know? <laughs> and, that's, and that's a good thing. Right, right. Now, the other thing is that in crossing, now doctors recommend that you get your heart beat increase and you and it's, as soon as you step on the curb your heart's going a mile a minute and then as someone had mentioned when you step on the curb and i learned this today when i for quick and today is that as crossing from jason over towards mill across mass Ave, the 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 light goes on for you to cross and but there is that little delay so it gives me a chance to like to get going and so more exercise is a positive type of thing altogether um the other thing is that the, uh, the lights for walking and crossing seem to be going off when there are no people there. So 9 o'clock at night, there's cross, no, no one's in, anywhere. And the poor cars are going to stay in, and sit the rest there too. And, and you mentioned something about the end of um, uh, Jason Street where there's a split there. I, I observe it and it, that it does appear to be enough room for two cars. But I think if they just threw some paint on there and designated it a little bit, I think that may increase the flow. So. That's what I have. Okay, thanks for your time. Thank you for those positive comments, Jerry. <laughs> um, Allison Goulder, Goulden. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to pass. I'm uh, going to for the past 10 years. I just want to support the reinstatement of the pedestrian only. 
Thank you. Special educators, so I'm all for inclusive signs, audible, but they should be audible in a in a specific <clears throat> format that's clearly understood by the pedestrian. Are you sure you don't want to speak? <laughs> <laughs> No, the only problem, thank you, Allison, the only problem we, is for, for the millions watching at home did not hear a word you just said. But for the millions at home, she was brilliant. Uh, Jane Eberly? Ever, Eberle? Excuse me? Sorry, Jane. Eberly. Well, the only thing that I think, uh, well, I'm at 87 Bartlett. The only thing that I think really bears uh, repeating again is that uh, I encourage all of you to act on this quickly to resolve the problem because as you've heard tonight, people's lives may depend on it. So thank you. Yes, sir. So that is the um, last name I have on the sign-up sheet. Is there anybody um, here? Unbelievable. Yes, sir, in the back. <laughs> oh, no, no, of course. Hi, I'm Christian Klein. I live on Newport right. Street. Uh, three quick things. Um, one, um, unfortunately, when this change happened, there wasn't really any notice, and I think that that led to a, a huge amount of confusion and, and everything else that has brought us here. Um, the second is because the concurrent countdown clocks are visible up Jason Street, um, if you stand on the corner, you can watch people up Jason, and when they see there's a counter and there was only five seconds, mm -hmm. they floor it because they know that they've got five seconds to get to the intersection. Um, and so if there's any way we can get, if we change the walk signal back, we get rid of that problem. You don't have people racing right at Jason. Um, and third, the, the, the one positive comment I have, um, I'm a frequent cyclist through this intersection. Traveling westbound on Mass Ave, because of the change in sequence, I am no longer at risk of being run over by somebody who is very late trying to turn left onto Mill Street through the uh, Green Arrow. And so that is the, uh, apparently the only real uh, positive of this so left onto mill did you say yeah or so if i'm traveling westbound on mass ave and somebody is right. coming eastbound on mass ave oh, oh, oh. there yeah. with the delayed green yeah. Yeah. there's always sort of the green arrow stops but then yeah. everybody sort of drifts into the oncoming traffic yeah. to make the turn so yeah. that doesn't happen right now thank you thank and you you're always worth listening to <laughs> okay so uh le let me I, i'm i if I may, just one moment. You know, uh, thank you. An issue we started to try and improve safety, we hear you, didn't work apparently. Uh, so, but the, the, the work of TAC has always been exemplary in terms of the kind of research and stuff that they have done in the past. Citizen involvement in Arlington is the blood of this town and we just couldn't do it without you. So the first thing I'd like to do, Diane, if I may, I want to ask Adam, uh, what's possible at this point? I mean, we're all hearing, uh, you know, the immediacy of this uh, issue. Uh, can I ask you or should I ask Mike? Or what, what could be changed quickly? Um, I believe we can put the timing back although we can't put it back exactly the way it was. Uh, we were short on pedestrian crossing time, so we would probably make some adjustments. Uh, the question then would be, how do we notify folks on Jason and Mill? They no longer can cross, you know, no longer take a left without someone coming at them, right? So there's the same get the message out there question. How do we mes message that if we were to just tomorrow change the timing? Uh, there would be implications with that, so we, that's something to think about. Um, I, we can put it back. I, I haven't thought through what other issues would arise if we were to just overnight put it right back. Right. But that's, I believe it's possible. I don't see why we couldn't. I mean, I, I would ask the traffic engineer, if he has, uh, Jason, if he has any other opinions on that. Should we attack him now? I would, yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Not attack, but yeah. sorry. What, what's possible right now? Good evening. Uh, well, certainly, um, it's, a, it's a brand new controller, and all the equipment is there, and, and, and it is possible to, uh, to, to go back to the exclusive pedestrian phase. I will note that uh, the signal contractor, I believe it was Ocean State Signal, uh, it, it is, the, the whole cabinet was not replaced, just the new controller in the cabinet. It's an older cabinet, and they were out there for a few hours 
rewiring it to, to go to the current phasing. Um, so it's not just a switch that, that they can switch in the cabinet. The contractor would have to come back and rewire the controller again and the cabinet. Thank you. The, the timings could be changed, but not the phasing. The exclusive pedestrian phasing, the uh, contractor would have to come back to rewire the cabinet. Okay. Which, which can be done in a matter of, of hours for the contractor, but it's, it's not just a flip of a switch. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, Ms. Mahan. Um, first, I'd like to uh, sincerely thank TAC and um, Mr. Rademacher, our engineer, um, for the time and effort that they put into this. Um, as the chairman has stated, um, we've certainly heard a lot from everybody here tonight, as well as emails and change.org petition and others. And um, sometimes you try things and they work, sometimes you don't. Um, I guess I would have a definite motion and then um, through the chair, sort of a uh, request, suggestion, um, perhaps amplifying on what I think Jason just said. First, I'd like to vote that the Board of Selectmen restore the exclusive pedestrian uh, crossing to Mass Ave, Mill Street, Jason Street um, as soon as possible. Second. Um, and, and everybody has already said all the comments. The only other uh, spice of life that I would add is just being down on the high school field um, in the middle of tournaments, whether it's soccer, football, cheerleading, et cetera. Um, I'm not even joking when I say I probably have had over 100 parents, staff, special ed bus drivers, uh, et cetera, um, all come up to me and just really give me three pieces of their mind in terms of that. Um, similar to what we've heard here tonight. Nothing that anyone was trying to do anything really detrimental that um, this is something we tried and it, it, it definitely isn't something that's working right now. So that would be my first motion. And then um, what I would do through the chairman is, um, and I think we heard in the town manager, um, in terms of uh, the traffic patterns, um, I have come down Mass Ave going eastbound past Whole Foods towards Cambridge, and now with that lane drop, um, where it used to be there would be two s solid left-hand lanes, what I would ask the town manager and um, DPW and the engineers is, A, if I had my druthers that Jason, um, Jason and Mass Ave, Mill and Mass Ave would go at the same time instead of staggered, as well as um, before, and I understand somebody spoke about this before, but especially if you go into the high school, God bless you, sporting events, uh, I know a lot of people are avoiding that left-hand lane because the delayed left isn't there anymore. So I don't want to be an engineer in terms of that facet of it, um, but I would like um, TAC, the town manager, and DPW, unless they've already discussed this, uh, my number one thing, my main motion is to restore the exclusive pedestrian crossing right there. If I may. Advice on the second part. I would just like to add a little note about the eastbound Mass Ave left turn arrow. Um, it, previously, it was a lead, and it would happen at the beginning. It's now been set to a lag. That change uh, is not, we, we understood from the beginning that that was not preferable for traffic, uh, but was required because of the lead pedestrian interval that we were providing. Um, we, we did not want to have the walk sign for pedestrians and at the same time giving people a left turn arrow mm -hmm. uh, because the arrow is, is even more forceful. Yes, you, you have the ability to turn left here with, uh, with no conflicts. So we, we certainly did not want that left turn arrow at the same time as the pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And because of the, 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 the concurrent peds, that's why we made the change to the lagging left. Mm -hmm. When we go back to uh, an exclusive pedestrian phase, we would certainly change that back to a leading left turn arrow. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chaplain. If, if I may, Ms. Mahan, I, I would suggest, um, if you're comfortable with it, that the motion actually be uh, reverting to the prior signal phasing, but all understanding that the pedestrian phasing would need to have an additional eight seconds added to meet standard. 21 to 27. 20, I think 29. So that would be 29. my 29. Yeah. motion. It's billed. No. Yeah. All accurate? right, so, all right, Mr. Dunn, uh, the part of the, I am very, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with bringing back the pedestrian only phase. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of discomfort bringing back the, the Mill Street and Jason Street opposing left turns again. 
Because one of the things that we do know um, is that we had a lot of accidents, and we had too many accidents of the people of people charging at each other, doing that left. And uh, I guess one of the, so let me propose a couple different things, one or possibilities that I would be more comfortable with. One is um, revert to the old system, but but then give it another try to see if we can you know, find a combination of the two, uh, like as in a combination of um, the current proposal and a, and a future proposal. Another one is to simply make it to say, it is the position of the board that we do not want concurrent, uh, or, or excuse me, that we do want protected pedestrian phase, and then say, okay, let's ask TAC and engineering to figure out the, the best configuration that protects the protected phase. Because I heard a lot of people say, I want a protected pedestrian phase, and I, very, and I understand that argument. I didn't hear anybody say, I want to play chicken uh, doing that left turn again. <coughs> I see Mr. Chubb. Yeah. So, and I, and I think this is where we get into the cake and eat it too portion of the, or, or the reality yeah. portion of the argument. So, uh, a couple of weeks back when I, when I first sat down with Jeff and Howard and Mike, uh, you know, that, that was also my first question. And I'll let Jeff speak for himself, but the answer was that there isn't enough time to do that all and not, and not further reduce the efficiency and backup and congestion in the intersection. And uh, I want to be very clear, I'm not dismissing any of the very valid concerns that were raised tonight. But when we revert, I don't think anybody here should be surprised if another group of people come back to the board and complain that they're now way backed up on Mill Street in the past month they've had free passage. So there's, there's never a perfect solution. I think we're moving in an appropriate direction, but I, I, I think you know, my, my job is to, to, put, to put the reality out on, on the table. I, I don't know if Jeff, you wanna add to that. Yeah, no, Adam said it uh, correctly. Uh, there's basically not enough green time to have an exclusive ped phase and split phases. The, the conditions will be worse than, than they are now with queuing and delay. I mean, are there other something in between? Maybe if you start going to lead phases on Jason or Mill, then we have to start looking at new signal equipment, you know, for for that. So that's possible, and you can. The left turns on Mill Street are high in the morning. The left turns on Jason Street are high in the afternoon. So it's, you know. What did you say lead, what was that equipment reference? Uh, the new signal equipment, um, because you'd have to give protected for a, a, a lead phase and then go you know, protected to yellow and green ball. So you'd need more equipment than that's out there today. Yep. And possibly more detection. Um, loops in the in the roadway or, or cameras than we have out there now. Okay. Joe. Hey, thank you very much. I mean, I, I think that we have actually a number of options. Thanks to the the work that TAC did, we actually had a number of build options that were presented to us. And it sounds to me like we're, if I'm not mistaken, we're converging on what was uh, presented to us as build number one. Um, and build one said modified lane use pedestrian crossing time of, of um, 29 seconds and optimized timings, I believe that, that maintained the concurrent did. build one did. It doesn't say it specifically, but it just references that as the, um, as the difference. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that's, that's actually, rather than trying to pick and choose ourselves, I think there was actually an option that was, was, was put forward to us. And yes, we'll have a level of service um, deterioration, the, the, the estimate was that we'd lose four seconds in the AM peak. I don't know in the PM peak what it is. It just says greater than 120, but it doesn't show a change between a no build and a build. It, it gets a little worse because the pedestrian. Once we touch the intersection, we have to make it up, bring it up to standard. So we need that, that 20, 29 second you know, pedestrian phase. Right. So it essentially gets a little worse. Right. Um, the lane designations help a little bit because people know which lane vehicles are supposed to be in, not like it was before when you had a, you know, a mixture of people in different lanes. So it helps a little bit. It doesn't totally get rid of that, that yeah. conflict, you know, crossing an intersection. Yeah. Um, which again would require um, more more ta more green time, you know, to do that. Yeah, and I think maybe it gets worse for motorists, but maybe a little better for pedestrians because right. we'll, they'll have right. greater. Um, 
uh, crossing time. So my inclination is that we be very specific and, and support um, uh, the, the build one option that was presented to us um, originally, which is essentially going back to where we were, some optimized lane markings, um, adding more time to the pedestrian crossing um, signal. Right. It, it, um, it makes sense to me. I mean, I think, you know, I think we all get it. We all recognize it. And it's kind of ironic because in a few minutes we're going to go back in the other room. We're going to talk about, um, in addition to our handbook and our regulation of public and private ways and parking public utilities, it says the selectmen will continue to be responsive to resident input, but also employ the expertise of the Parking Committee and Transportation Advisory Committee to carefully study and make recommendations on appropriate issues. So it seems that balancing what we've heard here tonight with some of the hard work the TAC has done, and I know even since this has erupted, TAC has been hard at work. I've accosted poor Jeff at cross country meets, and I know he's been down there, you know, making checklists of improvements, and some obstructions of signage and such have been changed down there, I think, even since this, right. this emerged. The DPW has been observing the conditions yeah. and making changes to signage that's been, and all that. So a lot has been going on, and, um, you know, we, we appreciate. Uh, you know, the board's support and, um, you know, you can't always hit a home run, you know? Mr. Byrne. Um, so I think we all, we all see where this is going. And the one thing I will point out is that I think um, for, from the second we took this vote, it has really been, been a pretty big failure um, from a um, public outreach standpoint. I, th I think this was really thrown at everyone um, in, in a fairly you know, unfair manner, if that makes sense. Um, and I don't think that any changes that are this big, and this is a pretty, you know, this is a pretty big policy change for us um, being the first one in town. And I think, uh, you know, I guess this is my mea culpa in that we really should have done a better job preparing the residents for it. Um, and uh, again, I, I guess I, I wasn't anticipating uh, this amount of blowback, you know, if you, you do go to many other cities and towns, they, they do do this, and it does seem to work, but I think we hear, hear it very clearly that, that it's not gonna work here right yet. Um, I, I do um, particularly um, think this intersection, the, the lighting really isn't appropriate for it. I know that was brought up, and that's um, something I was even thinking on the drive down here, here tonight. Um, so I am happy to support um, both motions. I, I do like the idea of I'm really looking at the build one um, option that Joe is looking at. And um, again, I think this is something that we'll have to rectify and again, look at moving forward. I mean, maybe there are different other, there are other intersection towns that might be more prime to, you know, more efficient usage of, um, you know, using, you know, unique crossing and turning points, but this obviously isn't one of them. So thank you. Okay, so Mrs. Mahan, please clarify your motion. As in, what's this build one? Tell me what else is included now. Whatever. Build one. Okay, yeah. my motion would be to adopt, uh, to, to A, restore um, the exclusive pedestrian crossing on Mass Ave Mill Street, Jason Street, by adopting build one as outlined and recommended by the Tr Transportation Advisory Committee. But that means lane markings as well, am I correct? And is there anything else to build one? No. no. There'd be no new mark. So what? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to clarify. What are we voting on then? Mr. The manager said Bill One would be. I think that's what we're saying. Right. That's basically what would have been. I'm just trying to see what. It would have been the op the optimization, which would be the markings that 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 are there, extending the pedestrian signal so that it's independent, but you'd still have Jason and Mill conflicting in their turns. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you all clear on what you're voting on? Because we need to be very careful that we don't go, we, we're, we're, we're in many ways going back to the problem of the accidents at this intersection because of that. So, but when we balance what's more important, pedestrian lives over car accidents, obviously. Uh, but, you know, I do think we need to keep studying this area um, to see what we can do. I'm, I'm with Mr. Dunn. I, I wish we could do it with the with the current mass Jason and Mill, but I understand about the backups that that would cause. Uh, so, on the motion by Mrs. Mahan, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. 
So we direct the manager to, as soon as possible, with the help from our engineer, uh, to get, the, get those lights changed immediately to pedestrian only. Uh, and uh, just before we move, we're, we're going to move back to the uh, selectmen's chamber for the rest of the meeting. You don't want to miss it, by the way. Don't feel, <laughs> don't feel you have to go home. There's a lot more to do yet. But we thank you all very much. I want to thank ACMI that's been able to do this as well. Good night. Thank you. All right, so we reconvene the selectmen's meeting of November 9, 2015. Uh, I want to start again by thanking ACMI for their ability to allow us to conduct this meeting in two different locations uh, seamlessly. Thank you very much for that. Uh, this is article number 14 now, or item number 14, excuse me, agenda item. So this is for approval, the board designees to the school enrollment task force. Adam? Uh, very, very simply, uh, as um, presented in the memo I uh, provided to the board for this agenda item, uh, the superintendent and I uh, would like to put together this school enrollment task force to discuss uh, the school enrollment pressures uh, that were discussed in depth uh, at the September 24th meeting in Town Hall. Uh, we wanted to have three school committee members, two members of the Board of Selectmen, member of Finance Committee, Capital Planning Committee, Permanent Town Building Committee, as, long, uh, as, excuse me, as well as myself and the superintendent. Uh, so uh, once we get uh, all of those folks designated, uh, which we should by tomorrow, uh, and especially when we get two board members, we'll start calling meetings of that group. So we'll be looking at both uh, the actual enrollment issues and then the various options and more options uh, than what was presented on the 24th. Um, so uh, if I may, uh, one of the issues that has been raised to me is the idea of should we have a couple citizens also on this committee? I know there's always an issue of size of committees, uh, but has that been discussed at all? or? So. I I've talked about it a lot. I've thought about it a lot with um, with Kathy Bodie, and you know, if if every uh, stakeholder group or citizen group that's asked me for a spot was granted one, we'd probably have a 15, 17 person committee, uh, which is unmanageable. Right. Um, I I guess the best I can say is these will be public meetings. They will all involve public input. It's not at all intended to be an exclusionary process. Exactly the opposite, an inclusionary process. Um, and I, I don't mean to be glib, but elected members of the Board of Selectmen are from the community. Elected members of the school committee are from the community, as are the finance committee members, the capital planning committee members, and the permanent town building committee members, that they're all volunteers from the community. So I, I don't see it as being exclusive of the community. I understand the requests being made, but I think this can still be a very inclusionary process while still having a decision make a structure that lends itself to decision making. Yep. I just wanted to no, raise it's a, it. So, totally fair question. So uh, since this is a, um, a subcommittee of the Budget and Revenue Task Force, uh, and I chair that, and I chair it uh, also uh, here of the board uh, until the spring, uh, I, I've asked if um, the two appointments would be uh, Diane Mahan and Joe Curo, the two appointments on the Board of Selectmen. Um, uh, do I need a motion for that, or I just I have couldn't I have, hurt to, to yeah, so moved. Is there a second? second? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you both for your willingness to serve. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Dunn, do we need the internet for this? Nope. So uh, this is discussion and approval protocol for adopting <coughs> amended agreement bonding withdrawing from Minuteman Regional School District. Okay. Yeah. So I, I just have a bunch of uh, so. I want to talk to a bunch of updates, talk about what I think the current set of issues are, and I would like, and at the end I'm going to make a motion for the board to uh, do some sort of support for the motion, for the uh, protocol for uh, adopting and amending bonding withdrawing, which was uh, the version that you have doesn't say, oops, which I, so it's in the packet, there's something, there's something they've called title. And so if no one, if you have preloaded a PDF, then you have it. And if you haven't, then I can pass you my iPad, which has it open. We can talk about it. Um, so Miniman push is coming to shove. Uh, there, uh, there uh, we've had a lot of meetings going <coughs> on with, uh, with, uh, that have been multi-town meetings, including one two weeks ago Wednesday, which was uh, selectmen from 15 towns. Uh, I think only one was missing. It was up in Weston that I thought was uh, 
more productive than usual. Uh, as you recall, actually, let me tell you, let's talk about the building a little bit. The building uh, process is moving into its, its next module, and I can never remember the module numbers, but in uh, November 17th, the school committee is going to forward, approve the schema, the Minuteman School Committee is going to approve the schematic designs, and the schematic designs will presumably be approved by the <coughs> Mass School Building Authority in January. Did I get that right, Adam? That is correct. Okay. Uh, and so, given that they are at the point of schematic design, then there's going to, the, provided that all that stuff gets approved, then at some point we, we start really get push coming to shove talking about what the funding is. And, uh, and, how, and so the two ways, of course, that everything could get, the funding can be approved is unanimous consent of, uh, Actually, I think this is kind of three ways. One is uh, the board, the school committee can vote a, a, a <coughs> bonding arrangement, and everybody can then just tell everybody about it. And unless somebody calls a special town meeting and says no, then that bonding happens. They can just send it to the towns and say, we need 16 yeses, as opposed to waiting for one to say no. The third way is the ballot question, where they put a ballot that's um, very prescriptive about the way it happens. They get to set the date. The polls are only open for eight hours. There's some interesting elements about it, but it's at the polling locations that we choose, and, and, and so we are, have to administer it and stuff like that. Uh, and it, it could, there are definitely people on the Minuteman School Committee who are fed up with the whole process who think, who say, there's no way we're getting to 16 yeses, so we're just going to do the ballot. We're just going to do it now, and we're just going to get it done with. Uh, and but I don't think they have the votes to get that right now, but it's close, like they could. And so as early as this November 17th meeting, hypothetically, the Minuteman School Committee could set a date for an election. Hmm. It, um, I don't think they have the votes. Hopefully they're not that rash. We'll see. So coming back from the building project, now talking about the regional agreement. So as you recall, 10 towns including Arlington, voted yes on the revised regional agreement. Uh, five towns didn't vote, and one of the towns voted no, who was Wayland. Wayland voted to, <coughs> they instead voted that they wished to withdraw, which requires unanimous consent. The first town to have a town meeting since then was Lexington, which was last week, and Lexington said no. So Wayland is not out, <laughs> like before we, anybody, you know, before anybody else even gets there. Who's on first? The thing, what a mess! It is. <laughs> they, it is unbelievable. Uh, the selectman from Boxborough, who is one of the five towns who didn't vote yes, one of the reasons <coughs> they expressed deep concern was because they didn't feel like they were guaranteed an out if they wanted one. Uh, I believe that that is mostly because they didn't study the issue closely enough, and the new regional agreement was actually their best chance out. However, they want an even better chance out. And so what they're doing, what they did is they proposed this protocol right here. <coughs> what the protocol says is sometime over the next few months, anybody who's, th any of the 16 towns who thinks that they want to leave takes a vote at the bo board level that says, yes, we want to leave, or we think we want to leave. And then they become what they call a declarant. <coughs> and once you're a declarant, then we, will, then we ask the, the Minuteman School Committee to propose a new regional agreement, which is the same as the one that we voted on two years ago, with an addendum on the top that says any declarant that chooses to leave may be permitted, will be permitted to leave upon approval of the <coughs> regional agreement. So basically, it's an explicit way of writing in the exit for the towns that want to go. Uh, Wayland clearly would take it. Mm -hmm. Boxborough might take it. I have to think Sudbury wants out. Dover is really um, conflicted about it. They oh, only sent right. two students, they to but they are actually, but they're actually really conflicted about whether or not they want to go. Lincoln does not want to leave, and Carlisle, I don't think, wants to leave uh, either. Am I doing? Am I missing anything? Got it. Okay. Um, 
so one of the th productive things that happened at this meeting was talking about this protocol for getting a new regional agreement, which I heartily endorsed. I said, you know, because I think that we can go, like it goes along with everything that we've already said, because as you recall, as a board, we adopted what's called the Needham uh, uh, Amendment, where we are going to let anybody go. This is just a different way of letting everybody go. If Belmont or Lexington or us chose to become a declarant, things would become very interesting. I don't think we, I don't see any sign that, that any of those three towns are thinking that that would be a good idea. Uh, and so what I'm working with is I'm trying to create this, get all those six towns who didn't say yes to get in a room and say, can you agree to this? And I'm actually saying that Arlington is, uh, we're, I'm putting Arlington in that room too, because we're the, you know, the big one in, in this thing. So uh, Saturday, <laughs> and then I said, I'm going to be out of town, so Joe can do it. Yes. <laughs> oh, I like that. Good job. Oh. So on Saturday, oh, Joe, yeah. Joe will be in Su Sudbury. Sudbury. At the Grange. At the Grange. It's, a, it's actually a beautiful building. Uh, and, uh, the six, uh, so there's a six plus one trying to get people to say, and I'm also doing a couple of meetings before and after that trying to also get that six plus one. So I'm working really, really hard to try to get this regional agreement over the finish line. At the same time, there are other meetings that are happening with like Lexington and Needham where they're coming to Arlington and they're saying, hey guys, uh, we really want this building and why don't you just say yes? <laughs> and oh, okay. yeah. exactly, that's kind of the way it's going. And the and the the I'm line of argument, forty percent of it. Okay, and yeah. the line of the argument is periodically, uh, don't worry, we really agree with you. After we get the new building, then we'll do a new regional agreement. And I'm I'm getting a lot of body language and saying, and I just want to say, if I know we've been saying the same thing for five years, but if we ever wanted to change our minds, this would be the time. No. So, okay. Yeah. Kevin is saying no. Well, I'm just, that's just me, but. Yeah, okay. But now would be the time if we want to do that. Okay. Uh, so, oh, like I, I wrote a, little, a couple notes to myself here, and I said, so the, the regional <coughs> agreement is the rock that I'm sticking to. If, if there's a hint that we wanted to, that would be, uh, that would be it. Um, I think that, uh, so other things that are coming up. Uh, a week from today, there's a meeting at Minuteman where Minuteman wants to talk to us about the various funding mechanisms. I think that this is their sell job on why the ballot isn't as bad as we think it is, which I think that they're going to hear is just as bad as, as we think it is. Uh, my current, I am hopeful that the school, Minuteman School Committee sees the light and doesn't try to force a funding mechanism on us too soon. And I hope that it can, we can get through a new regional agreement this spring, because even if the building doesn't work, the regional agreement is still a win for us. And so that's, the, that's where I'm trying to drag us along. I, keep, I talk to Adam regularly about what's going on. I talk to Al Tosti and Charlie Foskett and Steve DeCourcy and Sue Scheffler periodically, less than I talk to Adam. I talk to them probably with a similar frequency that I'm talking to you all here. Uh, I hope that people feel up to date. Um, and so that's, my, that's where I am. So I guess I'm looking for feedback. And I, I would formally um, make the motion that, uh, let's see, how do I want to phrase it? Uh, Arlington supports a revised uh, Minuteman regional agreement that consists of the 2013 language plus the Boxborough protocol. Is there a second? Second. I'll, I'll second. I, I have a question. Yep. Yeah, please. Well, now, I know that it, it doesn't seem likely that kind of the big fish want to leave. What would happen if, you know, either uh, ourselves, Lexington, et cetera, said that, you know, maybe we want out? Uh, I don't think that then the proposed regional agreement is really a vi or that proposed region is really viable. And I think that we would probably, I think we'd in some way have to say no to the regional agreement change and just be back at square one. Okay. Like so, I, I think we'd be back locked into the 16 yeah. towns without being, and anyone leaving. And, and, I, and I do understand that it's not the case, but I guess I'm trying to see if there is, you know, perhaps throughout this whole process, if it's becoming that the region isn't viable. I think that the, so 
The region is not enough to fill the school to the capacity that the Mass School Building Authority says. So this year, I guess the, the, in, the 16 sending towns at this point are 371 students, I think is the number that I've got in my head. And uh, the Mass School Building Authority said to build a Vogue school, you must have at least 600 seats in it. And so uh, to the way I think, one of the things that I think that I've heard that I've been repeating because I think it makes a lot of sense is, okay, that's fine. Then we will be prepared to pay for the capital for those 371 students. But, for, and, but if the state says that you need to build a school for at least 600, then that 230 difference, that is the state's problem. And the state needs to pick up the bill or figure out a mechanism to pick up for the bill. And they've done some improvements on that because the DESE, the D D Department of Education has said that they are they're making rules changes such that out of district sending towns will be forced to send spend a capital apportionment to so for instance waltham watertown medford the big three who are sending like 25 students each some of them uh, they will also have to pay say five grand a student capital each year and that will defray part of this so the question is is the region viable not exactly but it the, the, other, and the other aspect of it is that it does have this terrible governance structure that we've lived with for 45 years. And one hopes that with a revised, more intelligent governance structure, that it would become better run and more viable. That's what we're Thank you about. very much. No, I am. And I do, do appreciate your work on this. I know it's not easy. And I feel very up to date. So thank you. I have a question that I'm not even sure is applicable to a, what you're proposing, B, you're asking Joe to represent and proposing, <laughs> yeah. um, and <coughs> if it's germane to this. I, I'm just wondering if amongst this discussion, if we're go going to have and or is it appropriate or perhaps another venue, um, some sort of proposal or remediation regarding um, what I'll call the sizable number of out of district students at Minuteman and getting them somehow as a player to uh, contributing to financing the new Minuteman rebuild? Yeah, that's Am the, I saying that? Uh, that's the capital thing that I was just talking okay, about. Is that's that the 5,000, or 5,000 is an estimate number. It's not a flat number. Okay. So the way Desi is making this, proposing a set of rules, which are not fully fleshed out and not fully implemented, but they say that if you are a non-member town okay. and you want to send your students to a regional vocational school, and that regional vocational school can bargain with you to create an intergovernmental agreement. And the, one of the terms of that intergovernmental agreement is a capital payment, but only, interestingly, for mass, mass school building authority approved buildings. So it only works if you went through the whole state process from beginning to end, which Minuteman is currently trying to do. And so what that would mean is the Minuteman school committee would have to play sufficiently hardball with Waltham Watertown Mm -hmm. Medford and say we are not accepting your students unless you sign an intergovernmental agreement and the, then sign it and they have to keep pay, and then they, you know they have to pay and we have to come they have would they will be trying to convince the Department of Education to change the rule back and we're gonna be trying to convince them to keep the rule so the part of this that makes me deeply uncomfortable is that the bond is 30 years but Desi is not and not that you can answer for the Minuteman School Committee but do you see them adhering to that position that they will? Like, I, in, in my sense, yeah. they want to get as many students as they can In there. a new re regional agreement where, for instance, Arlington's vote counts for a quarter of the vote, I think we would have a pretty good chance of that. In a regional agreement where Arlington has one sixteenth of the vote, I am skeptical. Okay. All right, thank you. Piggyback on your question. Doing an awesome job. I don't, not yet. Updating us on your yeah. Doing an awesome job banging your head against the wall with the same things we've been. I would also really like to hear it, the, the, uh, the town manager's perspective. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't have very much to add, uh, fr uh, you know, further than what you said. Mm -hmm. um, uh, other than that, you know, even if we get this regional agreement, this is still, um, even if we're successful in pursuing the regional agreement one more time with the, the Boxborough Protocol, uh, it's still a big financial issue for the town to deal with. Uh, so, um, you know, myself, uh, Mr. Dunn, folks from Lexington, folks from Needham are still trying to push the legislature for further financial infusion into the project. I know uh, 
Dan had mentioned to me that at the meeting he attended, some of the other smaller communities didn't seem to have an interest as much in pursuing that, perhaps because of less of a financial stake uh, or perhaps because they think it's a fruitless, um, uh, fruitless pursuit. That being said, um, I, I sort of just want to take the opportunity to remind everybody that, you know, e even with the new regional agreement, excuse me, uh, there still remains the challenge of figuring out the proper way to fund it. That said, the regional agreement, uh, sort of an, an, uh, an approximate, brings down our annual debt payment um, on this project by about two to three hundred thousand dollars, depending on the actual final size of the project. So it's not insignificant. Uh, it would go from uh, somewhere between a 1.5 to 1.7 million dollar debt payment down to a, you know, 1.3 to 1.5 million dollar annual debt payment. So achieving this regional agreement certainly does improve Arlington's, uh, you know, ability and then correspondingly its desire to be, to approve a building project. Go. I think it probably is important to mention one confounding factor here too that, that those who've been kind of putting the building ahead of the agreement have been, <coughs> have been banging on and just just to make it a little bit more uh, um, frustrating uh, that MSBA is committing a 40% reimbursement on the on the project if we go with MSBA if if we don't and and the, the project is not uh, put forward right now there's still a potential that the work is going to get done but without the MSBA contribution and over time, not as a big bang yeah. um, project. So I, I think it's important that, that, that everybody recognize that, that that's been, been, been um, kind of threatened. <clears throat> threatened. Thank you. I was looking for the verb. I was looking for a diplomatic <laughs> turn of phrase, but yeah, thank you. <coughs> okay, so all those in favor of Dan's motion and wishing Mr. Kuro Godspeed on Saturday. Please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. So. Thanks for fighting so hard, Dan, really. And Joe. <coughs> Excuse and me. And Adam. So, uh, still we have no internet, am I correct? I'm not on. So here's what I'd like to recommend, all right, on the, on the three items that are coming up. Mm. All right, so approval, display of notices policy and then discussion on the handbook, and which you have here in front of us. And then 18 is also for the manual. So, uh, the, but, so you, we have the handbook, which is really what, and the manual is the full complete policies, uh, licenses, permits, applications, uh, everything. So uh, what I'd like to recommend is that we uh, discuss and uh, item number 17, uh, which is the regulation of public and private waste parking and public utilities. This would be for the handbook. The full policy would be in the actual manual. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, our goal is by the December meeting, the, the uh, Christmas meeting, what's that date, Marianne? 21st. 21st is to hand you the handbook for you to take over the holidays and for us not completed, I mean, for you, for, for you to read over the holidays and for us to approve sometime in January and then have it bound and finished by, uh, March. what, March? Was that our goal? Yes. March, Steve, yes. So uh, we're pretty close uh, at this point. Now the manual, uh, we've been approving all along. The manual is our policy. <coughs> we've gone through pretty much all of them at this point in time. You see these couple like the public display that we need to uh, finally approve. But, so can we take up at this point item 17? All right, yes, Mr. Mr. Anderson, are we? Are we going to take up the notices policy this evening? Is that your we opinion? can if you feel you've read it enough. My my problem is we don't have it in front of yeah. us because, but if you, I mean, if you I had a chance to, to read it beforehand uh, and are, and are prepared to, I'm 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 ready. Stephen and I. Have <coughs> I have two hard copies if someone has to read it. Right. I, I only raise it because I know that the the proponent of the original warrant article that led to this is, has been patiently waiting for several right. hours. Right. Yes. Which one do you want to do? <laughs> well, do you all feel ready to talk about the public notices? Yes. Yes? Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Yep. Okay. Christian, do you want to? Mm -hmm. or have you seen it? Do you know what we're talking about? Yeah. No, I just, my understanding is the language that was originally appeared in the second uh, report to Emmy. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. I I'm need done. to, I need, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I need to add one point. Um, okay. Fortunately, there was some sort of technical problem where the revised, I made one minor revision to that uh, policy in the form of an addition, yep. which was uh, to essentially include a clause that said nothing in this policy shall be construed to um, uh, regulate uh, uh, signage um, protected by uh, First Amendment rights, such as political signage for temporary political signage for campaign purposes or other uh, political uh, activity. So that there's not any question. That's always been the board's practice, but I'd like to make it explicit in that policy that this essentially this does not apply to um, you know, election signs and things of that nature. Okay, okay Mr. Dunn. I'm sorry, I don't know why that didn't get, didn't get transferred over. But. Uh, I don't know whether it was I don't know why this hasn't occurred to me before, or whether it's I knew, read something new or what it was. But uh, I, came, <coughs> I came to the realization when I read the packet this weekend that we're t asking anyone who wants to post a sign to come to town hall to fill out an application first. Is that, that's correct, right? That's what the current draft, the draft that was in our packet this time said. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't think we should do that. And I've, so I, the parts of the guidelines, the things where we actually say what should and shouldn't be permitted, I really, like that's the part I really like. The, the part where we <coughs> say you have to come to town hall and you have to get a permit before you put up these signs, I think is um, something that we will, the people who put up the signs that we don't like aren't the people who come and ask for permits anyway. Yeah. And all it is is gonna be, it's gonna be a pile of paper shuffling through uh, this office. And then there's gonna be a sign out there that will say, does this <coughs> sign have a permit or not have a permit? And there's no particular filing method of it. And I'm reminded of how the town used to have a uh, policy for yard sales, where you had to register your yard sale, which some people complied with and some people didn't comply with. And in the end, all of the registrations for the yard sales were simply paper that no one ever looked at it or you know, did anything. And then we realized that it was just, we, we, you know, it was the wrong kind of bureaucracy. So I was thinking about how to make this a, a functioning policy and all of the stuff that we talk about in the rules on this are related to a date. And it seems to me that one of the, the way that we can get around having people come in here and getting approval or not is by saying all signs of this nature must have a date associated with them. And what is a legal or not legal sign is how it behaves related to the date. You know, is it two days before? Is it seven days after? And so if you don't have a date or you're too early or you're too late, then it's not a compliance sign. And then you, then anyone can just go rip it down and say, the yeah. That's an interesting question. So I don't know exactly how we want to do that enforcement, but regardless, but reg enforcement, the challenge of who does the enforcing exists whether or not we do the permit. Yeah. I just don't think that the actual concept of coming into the selectman's office and filling out a piece of paper that says, I'm going to go put up more pieces of paper, it doesn't seem like a smart use of our resources. Doug, did you want to respond to that? So that's a broader idea than I was initially prepared to respond to. But I, the one thing that I do want to note is this, this is not all categories of signs. There's a relatively specific set of things that the amendment to the bylaws permitted and took out of zoning. So we haven't completely solved all issues with all signs. We've solved some issues with temporary signage of a certain nature um, being put up for certain types of neutral purposes. I don't think, I think that Mr. Klein, that was your original intent, and I think that's more or less what's been effectuated. So uh, it isn't all signs, but that said, there is going to be what Mr. Dunn suggests with any type of regulation of this nature is that there's going to be an administrative process and there's going to be an enforcement piece of it, which is someone's going to have to go out and say, you put in this application, we approved it, but your sign is still up two weeks after it was supposed to come down. Uh, I don't have a, I, I, I'm not going to comment on, 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 on whether or not, I, I would have to look back at the zoning bylaws and the town bylaws a little bit more carefully to make sure that um, we could achieve the bylaws 
or we can achieve the bylaws in Tampa to make sure that there's no conflict with that, with Mr. Dunn's proposal. I'm not saying that it's wrong, I'm just saying that I would want to be a little bit more thorough than, 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 than on the spot, saying that that's okay given the complex interaction between zoning bylaw, town bylaw, on these limited category of notices. Thank, thank you. I mean, I, I think I think that Mr. Dunn raises a, a very good point. I think the little kid loses her puppy dog or something. We don't want her having to come in and uh, and fill out an application. But I think I'm hearing the council say that he needs some more time to, to go over this one more time. And although I felt that I was ready to discuss it, <laughs> um, I, I, I I think the the point is well is that what I'm hearing? Uh, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be comfortable saying right now that something that which I think sounds like a terrific idea. It's just <coughs> a, a different <coughs> approach Excuse to me. this issue than the way in which um, this has been sort of presented, um, both in terms of the board's previous comment as a draft regulation model. Uh, that doesn't mean I think we're bound by that because town meeting only voted to amend the zoning bylaw and amend the town bylaw. Mm -hmm. So innovative ideas that would be better than a sort of traditional regulatory framework are fine with me. I just would want to make sure that I'm sure that, 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 that it can work without violating either one of those bylaws. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I know that everybody wants this to <laughs> yeah. be over and done with because people have been waiting patiently. I just, I don't want to yeah, Stephen, sorry, yep. Um, would this, would the Attorney General's decision have be changed at all if we go back and kind of redo what went for previously? No, so the Attorney General is only reviewing it to make sure that the actual change to the zoning bylaw and the town bylaws themselves are legal, mm -hmm. they are. So um, then we how can we play go around about, with it? Yeah, whether or not it's exactly as advertised um, or not <coughs> exactly as we contemplated because a better solution has been come up with, um, they wouldn't get into that. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to, to reconsider this according to Dan's ideas. So we want to move to table? I move table. Second. So, Kristen, do you want to comment on this concept of having to apply or not? Well, I, uh, yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> Because of the millions listening at home, although it's fewer now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Christian Klein. Um, so essentially, the I think the only thing that was requesting approval from the Board of Selectmen's office was if you were going to place a notice specifically on public property, <coughs> yeah. and it was there to protect the town mm -hmm. so that people just didn't come and tape things to the side of City Hall, mm -hmm. um, but that you could put things on private property with the approval of the owner and the sort of the, the basis of that was a prior discussion that was held in the spring with NSTAR, who's the owner of the telephone poles, who said that as long as mm -hmm. we are not interfering with their ability to maintain the poles, then they really don't care. Um, yeah. I, I think I, I'd still prefer to table till I can actually have the policy in front of me mm -hmm. while I vote on it. So the internet actually came back. It, 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 it mine's still mine's loading. Mine's still off. It says loading, uh, yeah. loading, oh, really? loading. Oh. I have two of them, and they're both the same. <laughs> I have Doug's and mine. And also, I'm pretty sure at town meeting what we approved was that there was the, were the changes to create the definition of notice, to move notices out of the zoning bylaw, to put them in the general bylaw. And in, in the general bylaw, it was going to be governed by regulations as set forth by the Board of Selectmen. Yes. So no matter what regulations you set, you're not affecting the decision of town meeting. I agree. Yeah. I, so to thank Mr. Chairman, if I may, yes. yep. uh, uh, so I hadn't considered the distinction that you're about the public property uh, application about what the how that this application does apply to a more narrow scope, mm -hmm. and that does uh, that makes me stress a lot less about it because it becomes oh, le le less necessary. And I think that maybe the way to do this, uh, uh, Doug at all. If we decide that we do want to stick with the application, then it's a display of notices permit application just to make sure to make it more clear that that's for the public po property part of it might uh, w would definitely help. Um, I can vividly remember last spring reading the policy 
and being very happy with the policy. And somehow, I either didn't look at the form or the form wasn't there this spring, I don't even know which, but it was when I read this, the form this weekend that if I, like, I kinda, that was when I seized up and said, oh my God, what are we doing? Mr. Yeah. Chairman, if I may? Yes. Uh, one of the things that is the, is, is, is already a win, yeah. is, uh, and I hate to be wishy-washy about something, but if there's some specific pressing deadline that concerns people, um, one of the reasons we took this out of zoning bylaws is so that this policy can be changed on a moment's notice. Well, not a moment's notice, but it can be changed on a 48 hours notice in terms of having a meeting. So this board can adopt a policy tonight and change it by the next meeting if there's some specific concern that Mr. Klein has or somebody else has about getting a procedure in place I know that sounds silly, uh, and in some ways it is. I don't like it, but if there's some specific concern that this has to be approved tonight, we could approve this policy as is and then tweak it for the, by the next meeting. I, I don't, I, I just wanna put that out there that that's, it's not a splitting the baby situation because all you're doing is refi refining your own policy. So is there, is there a specific, uh, is there a specific set of events that anybody is concerned about we need to get this policy not that I'm aware of at this stage now. Yeah. And Mr. Burns stated he'd like to wait until he can have the whole, and Mrs. Mahan as well, have the policy in front of them, so. Yeah, but I came in ready to approve it, and then there was a bit too much discussion. Yeah, that, that I uh, threw mm -hmm. a me wrench, feel sorry. comfortable moving forward with it. I can take, uh, so uh, Mr. Chairman, I can take another pass at it uh, and try and <coughs> reduce it a little Excuse bit, make me. it a little bit clearer, and then maybe uh, Mr. Klein and I can I would talk and make that. sure yeah, that. that'd be great. Because this is, I want to make, make sure that this is, been terrific work by him throughout the whole process of a initiating the Warren article, drafting a lot of this stuff for the selectman hearing, and, and helping this specific issue be prepared for town meeting. So I would want to be respectful of, of, of that. I'd like to save the poor soul from having to come back here, but. Well, if I can just get a lower number in the order, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> can I buy less than five? <laughs> Make a note of that, Marianne, if you would please, for the next time we have this on. Yes. All right, so a motion to table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Uh, so then the next one is in front of you uh, in uh, hard copy for the handbook, Regulation of Public and Private Ways, Parking, Public Utilities which Mr. Kuro quoted from at, in, the, in the other meeting. Any, any amendments, changes, wording? Yes. Yes. What? You sat with us and did this. I know, and you told me that I had to bring this to the board because <coughs> oh, you right. disagreed on it. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> I know it is good where it's going. Um, right, Stephen. Yep. So, uh, um, page two under A2, the final sentence of the first paragraph, I, um, or the final three words of the first paragraph in the town, I would like to remove. And this goes back to the debate we had a few months ago over the Arlington International Film Festival, um, hanging signs um, within Arlington, even though they um, were holding their festival outside of Arlington. You know, and w when, we, when we heard that, my contention was that um, I was okay allowing them to put up signs because it still promoted the town of Arlington. And I, I still think that the town benefited from having those signs <coughs> up. Um, and I think that the language as currently written within the town um, might restrict our ability to do so and allow um, you know, things that might benefit the town and in a fringe manner even that would um, not allow us to take action to support that, I think, by hanging, hang, like, potentially the signs. So I, I'd, I'd like to, to remove it. I, I know this, it's been a long night, and I was hoping that we'd get to this uh, before 11 o'clock so we could have a vibrant debate on it, Mr. Chairman, which we, we're just making it. But that's, that's where I'm at, and uh, other than that, I, I'm very happy with it. And again, um, as we've been doing, every week um, thank everyone who's involved there's a tremendous amount of work so is that a motion mr that Bird? is a motion <coughs> i'll second that. there's a second i'll second that. let me tell you why that motion is wrong <laughs> um, 
No, uh, no, I mean, I, I understand the point, um, and I voted with this board on the International Film Festival, although I wish I hadn't. However, the argument that was made is how much they do within this town, outside of the International Film Festival actually being held in Kendall Square. So I think technically they still fit within that definition, if you would. But I, I hear what you're saying, and that's just my two cents worth. Mr. Kiro. Um, I actually have a different twist on, on why I think we may have, there may be an issue with this, this language. This language is actually in the policy too, which might have to be revoked. <coughs> but we, we, um, we say here to, um, it's to, bless you. Oh, oh, that's Sorry. A, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> Publicize upcoming events or to designate or promote the unique commercial, historic, or cultural character or status of an area or district within the town. So it's basically just referring itself to um, events and geographical areas. But this, this board approved actually the um, Arlington Public Art um, Initiative where the, the youth art is going to be going up on, on banners, which actually doesn't seem to quite even fit the definition here. I think we, we might want to just rethink the wording a little bit, but I'm a little Nothing is coming to me immediately. Because that doesn't refer to an event, it doesn't refer to a place, <coughs> but it is actually promoting the, 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 the cultural yeah. vibrancy of, of the, right. the town as a whole. So you're saying that is uh, unless a, unless you promote say that, cultural character. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. All right. Any other uh, so the motion <coughs> is to, uh, of an area or district period, right, Stephen? And just uh, yes. delete within the town. Correct. All right. And and uh, so can we also say this would apply to the policy, Doug? Yes. Or would we have to bring the policy forward and then vote it? I think. We probably have to bring the policy forward. Well. Just because we've done it that so way around the time. I just think it'd just be, it'd be a matter of making the policy mm -hmm. consistent with the policy. Okay. So these are a broad set of principles and policies, whereas your actual application is yep. a little bit more narrow. Yep. Uh, but uh, Kevin, I, I think that this is noticed as being an issue that's on this meeting for discussion. If you guys want to condense that vote, I'm comfortable with it. In other words, the topic is very clear that this is what's being voted upon. Yep. So if you want to make them consistent, I, I think that that's fine. Okay. I think we want to make them consi consistent, don't we? Yes, and we don't want to handcuff our ability moving forward. Okay, so all those in favor of the wrong motion by Mr. Byrne, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. But Can I say nay? <laughs> May. Um, oh, you're nay too? Well, Danny, I didn't hear you before, but I've been still thinking about it. Yeah. And, but I, the, the, yeah. Uh, I'm, I think that uh, everything that I would want to approve, I can still approve under the language within the town, including the... Right. So. Wait, why, why are you nay? I, I zoned out. Uh, because I don't feel as restricted by the words within the town. Because the... So, S S Stephen says he wants to uh, support the like <coughs> uh, International Film Festival, for instance, which is partly in the town and partly out of the town. <coughs> and I'm trying to think of like all the things that I would con contemplate wanting to put up on a banner. And it's like, you know, like a... The, the United States celebrates its 250th birthday. Would we put that up? Yeah, I can count that as with it being within the town. Like if we want to do like a Boston Strong something because of something related to the marathon, is that related to things within the town? Like I just can't come up with anything that wouldn't also, that I couldn't also argue is within the town. Is within I don't, the I'm not sweating it either way. Either way. But can you take the vote again? Because I didn't vote either way. Wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah. No, I honest to goodness, I was looking at Charlie Lyons. Slam me over the head. Charlie Lyons retires from oh. Shawshank. That's what I was looking at. Sorry. So if you, get, I didn't even vote. I just wasn't paying attention. It's coming back. The internet's it's coming back. back. Okay. Yeah, that's what it did. The motion by Mr. Byrne Sorry. is that on this handbook under section <coughs> uh, A2. A2, first paragraph, mm -hmm. his motion is to remove the words within the town. Yeah. From this handbook and from the policy uh, in the manual. <coughs> uh, 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. 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 I'm sorry, I wasn't no, meaning to. I, honest it. to God, was. It is a long night. Yeah. I was reading that. It wasn't even. I'm Kevin like, how did he get in yes. that again? Kevin was just already re resigned to the, to the defeat. Maybe. I was. I was. And Dan saved my day. Thank you, buddy. So, 18, should we table as well? And no, but should we pass the. the oh, yes, the, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So now. <coughs> All those in favor, as it as it reads, please signify by saying aye. 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 Um, and uh, so 18, uh, that's the full policy. Have you all read it enough prior to this? Does you feel you can? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Yes. This, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. 18 is, is actually the betterment's policy. It's just a detailed rundown on how the betterment process works. Right. We talk about the general, like it's a paragraph on betterments, but it's, it's actually just limited to betterments, 18. But it's for the manual? Yes. Right. Yes. Right. So is there a motion? I move approval. Second. Approval. Second. Discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Open your calendars, please. <coughs> Excuse me. We're here doing this already. So January. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm still struggling. No, oh, come on. Oh. OK, I'm ready. So the 16th of January <coughs> would be Martin Luther King Day. So what would the world think about 9 and 23? Oh, actually, I already oh, have those down as dates. I think you're, you're, in, the you're in the wrong year, you're the wrong, I think. Yeah. You need January. Of 2016. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. the ninth is a Saturday, right? Yeah. Yep. You're in the right year. Celebrate the 18th. Oh. What am I looking at here? January 2016, Monday 9, Monday 23, and I also have two selectmen meetings down. Huh? Wait a minute. I have I have January 2016 as a Friday. What day is it? Correct. Yeah. You look at it, November. Huh? And it's a Saturday. November. Not, November is nine and 23. Look at that. January. Oh wait. There's, <coughs> Yeah. Keep going. Now we're there we go. Okay, okay never mind. <laughs> never mind. That's a great name I'm saying I got a different January 26th. I got to go home. I, okay. I just, I, I got to get out of here. Okay, right. so the 18th would be Martin Luther King Day. Yes. How about 11 and 25? I'm okay with that. Okay. <coughs> Am I, everybody I'm saying okay to those? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, understanding that the 25th uh, uh, most likely will be the special town meeting that we've been talking about, so, which would make sense to have a board meeting. Mm -hmm. And if we have a really big agenda, we could start at 6. So February. <coughs> uh, so the 15th would be, uh, is that President's Day? Yeah, February vacation week. Of February. So, how about eight and twenty-two in February? Looks good. Unless anyone else. <clears throat> yep. How are we all doing? Um, mm -hmm. Hang on. Yep, it's good. In March. Mm, you want to do seven twenty-one? Seven and twenty-one. I'm. I'm still. I'm oh, sorry. I take a. I actually like put them in right <coughs> now, so I. Oh, sorry. Still losing. I'm sorry, what were the March again? 7 and 21. Because the 28th would be dicey for me, but okay. it shouldn't be predicated on me. April. So, uh, election will be Saturday the 2nd. So we have to meet the 4th for organizational, right? Okay, so 4th and 18th. Uh, Patriot's Day, three. Oh, man. Yeah. <coughs> fourth and 25th or fourth? Yeah, I'm going to say four and 25, and if you have to add 11, okay. you can. Does that sound right? Well, if you have to add one, yes. You don't have to worry about that. And that would bring us up to? Man. Do May or leave it? 
probably no, set with these four months. Yeah. So what was what was uh, I'm sorry? April was fourth of the organization. Four and twenty-five. Four and twenty-five. Yeah. Okay. Because of Patriots Day. Sounds like a plan. Okay, so correspondence received. Receipt. Is there a second? Second. But, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. And so you two have a meeting tomorrow related to this, correct? Medical marijuana? It, it's, it's actually been pushed back, but I am meeting with him. Okay. But this was what they sent us the day after the yes, last meeting? Yes, to make it official. Yes. Okay. All right, so move, uh, moved and received. New business, Marianne Sullivan. Nothing. Doug Heim. Not tonight, sir. Adam Jeff Delane. I'll pass, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Really? Nothing? Do you want me to come up with something? You, no, I was gonna I'm say. Just shocked, <laughs> as, I'm shocked, you, you're such a busy guy. Mr. Byrne. Too late for new business, Mr. Greeley. Wow. I hate to break the trend and I'll make it brief. Um, just want to say I'm going to do my usual plug. Um, the Arlington High School cheerleaders, cheerleaders competed at Woburn High School in their league competition. Um, and they made the qualifying bill, bid to go, go on to regionals, um, which will be November 15th, Sunday, at Woburn High School. Also, at the same time, I went um, yesterday, Sunday, because Arlington High was last week, to St. Mary's and Lynn where Arlington Catholic High School um, also competed in their league competition. Um, they also uh, qualified to move on to regionals. And it's really not related to Arlington, but it is because it's my daughter, Rebecca, and my best friend's daughter, um, Jackie, who are the coaches for Medford High School Mustangs, also competed yesterday and will also be moving on to regionals. So uh, next Sunday, for myself personally, I have Arlington High, we, uh, I have Arlington Catholic, and then I have my daughter's team, the Medford Mustangs, who fortunately, unfortunately, will all be competing against each other. So. I was gonna say, when's Mahan be Mahan? <laughs> it's right there, so, nice. but but it, it's nice, and it's, it was really nice to um, cheer on Arlington Catholic High School, and um, Ryan Gedron, which is the head coach for Arlington High Football, came with about 20 of his players to the Wuben competition, and Serge Clivio was there yesterday for Arlington Catholic, the, uh, Arlington Catholic football coach to be there for his cheerleaders. And I just think it's nice when not only girls and boys support each other, but also the coaches do. So just wanted to put a little plug in for that. And that's all my new business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Nothing. Mr. Kiro. I had some, I'm gonna to try to abbreviate it really quickly. I mentioned to the chair that the uh, members of the Poet Laureate Screening Committee are interested in coming in to meet with the board to talk about uh, potentially being designated as an advisory committee throughout the year to support the program with the chair's indulgence. Um, also, um, I was contacted by uh, the chair of the uh, Vision 2020 Fiscal Resources Task Group who would like to have a conversation with us about um, warrant ordering and ways that we might think about that. And I don't know. Um, they invited me if I wanted to come go hear what they had to say at their meeting or we could invite them in here to have that discussion, I think, at the chair's pleasure. Yeah, sorry, um, Joe, I'm, I'm doing the dates happy too. Either way. Who is it who would like the to? The Division 2020 Fiscal Resources Task Group would like to talk about potentially thinking about some tweaks in the way that we um, what are the warrant articles and kind of present that to us, some ways to think about that. But I'm, I'm willing to go get the information and come back or we can invite them in, whatever is the chair's pleasure. Well, uh, I'm, the chair's pleasure is that we're in charge of the warrant um, and the moderator, the moderator wants to talk about the ordering of warrant articles and, yeah. and the finance committee wants to talk about the ordering of warrant articles. So, the, I mean, to be honest, if you'd like to go and listen and then come back, mm -hmm. that's what I prefer. Okay, yeah. I'm happy so to do it. If we're going to have a meeting, then I would want all of those stakeholders in the room yep. to discuss it. I, I find that conversation to be just circular. Yeah. Every, I mean, mm. like, it maybe comes some, up every couple of years. <clears throat> maybe somebody's going to have some brilliant way to reorder it, but everybody wants some other order, other than the order, than there's the order. And right. just, I, I have yet to find a compelling reason yeah okay okay and and but the other the other group joe is uh 
that you want them the to poet, poet laureate. <coughs> they were the screening committee per the warrant article, but <coughs> they were interested in supporting on an ongoing basis. They were talking about a war, another warrant article. I said, I don't think it's necessary. And consulting with counsel, he thinks that we can do this on our own. And so do you want to invite him in for a future meeting? Sure. Or I've talked to Lizzo, so. But can. I'd recommend not the 23rd. Right, Marianne? Aren't we kind of filling up for the 23rd? Yes. I, I think you may be. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to have a better look as we see. Yeah, I don't think it's working. Okay. The only other thing I want to mention, I went over to the Belmont Town Hall uh, last week, I think it was, on um, air noise. A, a number of the, the uh, people have been working on this in some of our neighboring communities <coughs> were there. They had an incredible set of data that they had put together uh, to really um, uh, convincingly demonstrate through data the, the impact of, the, of uh, air noise <coughs> and some of the affected uh, corridors. I think walking out of there, the conclusion was um, that uh, with the dismissiveness that the FAA has really treated all of the communities with, that our only real hope is to try to enlist Massport as an advocate on behalf of the communities, which hasn't been successful up until now, but um, that was <coughs> the, um, I think what we walked out of there with, um, the kind of a consensus that we should be talking to our delegations to kind of push on Massport to kind of, um, rather than being just um, acquiescent in the, the um, uh, uh, everything that the FAA has, has put forward, try to present, help us present the case. Uh, on the air noise. I'm sure some of you have been getting phone calls too and, and it's, uh, it's a serious situation. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, so um, just again, we want to invite everybody to participate in Veterans Day. Um, uh, parade starts 1030 at Walgreens and ceremony at 11 o'clock at uh, uh, the, uh, the Central Fire Station. Uh, held rain or shine and um, Joe and I uh, participated in the uh, Town Day celebration um, and <coughs> realizing uh, the amazing support we get from sponsors and our own staff and all of you. And uh, next year's the 40th Town Day, so we want to make it a big one. And uh, we're looking for people who'd like to help us uh, do so. Uh, that said, the next meeting of the Board of Selectmen is November 23rd. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. I'm not sure. All those in favor, <laughs> please signify by saying aye. Aye. Good night, Arlington. Good night.